Okay, today we're joined by two guys who really don't need an introduction, but in this case, if you don't know, we have the king of old school, Steve Carino, and the enforcer, C.W. Anderson, the extreme horseman. Alright, welcome to my show. You two are internet leg legends for one particular story that happened in Japan, which we will get into. But as far as I know, it's never been told on camera, much less together, correct? Nope. No. <laughs> okay, cool. It's just one story. There's yeah. plenty. Alright, people people been wanting to interview you two guys. But we here at nokfaven.com. We're the ones who could get it done. CW and Karina, welcome to my show again. Thanks for oh, having thanks, me. yeah. This is the first time we've ever done something like this. Yeah, normally it's together. One part, two part radios, yeah, and, you know, stuff like that. But this is the first time we ain't ever, ever done it together. Yeah, I want to thank you. Uh, I was telling him earlier, you know, it's an honor really to have you here. No problem. Yeah. Okay, first, first things first. You two literally been friends for how long? 18 oh, years. 18 years. Yeah, yeah. 18 I was years. pretty much uh, a rookie when I met CW. Yeah. We met like at a strip club, right after a show. No, it was at a um, an indie show in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, for some some guy, some big heavy set guy. I remember I was working. That's right. I was yeah. working Timber that night. That's and I forgot right. who you were working. That's when you were like really skinny, had black hair, and I was doing something. Full of life. Yeah, full of life. Oh, road ahead of you. <laughs> now the bridge is empty. Um, <laughs> it's one of those that you ran by said something smart to me like it is a joke and it's like we clicked yeah and then, from there, and then wasn't it like we, we met up real quick after and like in like a bad pennsylvania show yeah we were like doing western a western yeah, road did, trip we right? did a road trip together and we went to a we saw a strip club sign <laughs> off the side of the road it you, was you yeah, but go, it was one of those like bad ones yeah, too you yeah you had to go down a dirt road to get to it <laughs> like a trucker's a strip club. Girls were walking around saying, "Hey, how about me giving the lap dance for a dollar? <laughs> lap dance for a dollar? Yeah, you yeah. got two you teeth got in your mouth and one in your pocket." Uh, yeah. And we hit it off right yeah. away. We're like, we both had like the same sense of humor, <laughs> and like and other guys were like enjoying this place. Me and C W were like, you know, trying to make each other laugh with. And he's like the king of one liners. So yeah, from that moment on, we were we were close. Yeah, and it tried. It went like that for a while. Oh, no. All right, um, you guys worked a lot in the Carolinas with the Omega guys and were part of a huge group that got jobs somewhere. Yeah. What what was that like? It was, for, for me, it was one of those where people could come and pay and watch. For the ones that don't know, it was myself, Steve, Matt and Jeff Hardy, Hurricane Helms, Gregory Helms, Joey Abs. Uh, the Dubs, Shannon Moore, Shannon Moore, Joey Mercury, Joey Matthews, Christian uh, York, Christian York, uh, Marty Garner, Lodi, Toe, Otto Schwanz, all of us ended up Holy getting shit, man. getting jobs somewhere, and these people were paying five bucks to come watch all of us wrestle, busting our ass, yeah, too. killing ourselves. Yeah. And now, what did you think that show would cost you? But we were all... We that was a Omega? Yeah, yeah. A little bit of Omega and a little bit of SCW, Greg, uh, we call him Count Grog. It was a little bit of his SCW and the Omega as well. It right. was, if he won't run in one weekend, Omega was, and, and vice versa, it was, and it was everywhere. And it was like, we didn't even realize, but like our crew was taken over, you know, because it, we had such, like, diversity, you know, yeah. like... Our old school style, Joey, Joey and Christian coming up with high flying style, Matt and Jeff being the high flyers, yeah. you know, uh, Joey Abs being the power guy. There were, there were so many different aspects. Joey Abs, Mer Mercury. Uh, yeah, Joey, Joey, uh, Joey Abs, he was uh, Venom. He was Venom at Omega, but he was Mercury for the Kings of the No, Joey no. Matthews was Joey oh, Mercury. Yeah, Joey Abs was with the Mean Street Posse. Posse, yeah. Oh, yeah he, he was he the was, working member of the Mean Street yeah, Posse. Yeah, he was. He could work his ass off and he likes it he was the power guy shannon christian joey they were the high flyers matt and jeff were the extreme high flyers even yeah. before it was and we were the hardcore guys along with Lodi. you know yeah Lodi and that and Lodi too. always and every weekend you know he said we were taking over we were packing. matt was booking that right when matt was mac and, and matt and thomas simpson were yeah. booking the mega count grog was 
book in the. Were you there when he had a beef with Manny Fernandez about something? Yeah, yeah. Steve was. Yeah, what it was happened? No, like his man, he's crazy, right? So and uh, hopefully he'll never watch this video. <laughs> he, like he had a reputation where I heard his story and um, Jeff said the story. The, the, I'm way, sorry. the way that I heard it was <laughs> I heard both of them. Was that like Manny? called Matt up and said, hey, can I have a booking? Matt's like, no, no. He's like, well, can I come down and get a table or something like that? I don't know what it... Then all of a sudden, just Manny just shows up out of nowhere, puts up a gimmick table, and then Blake demands a payday or something like that. And, uh, some of the some of the, veterans, some of the veterans would do that every now and then on the shows like that. Just show up Just like show that. up and say, yeah. I want a table and sell gimmicks. Yeah. yeah. Sell I think gimmicks they are they are. Yeah. He's so, supposed to pay some type yeah, of respect, you know. <laughs> what do you um thoughts about man Jeff at the time coming up and now you know how you feel about? Him? I haven't seen some of your thoughts. Your thoughts. I, in the beginning, you, you, those guys always had some. We all in some way had something special. But Matt and Jeff, they were you know had that drive and they always especially you know, Matt. Especially Matt. Matt was always I always thought Matt was the brave. Yeah. Jeff was the athletic one, um, and they always had that drive. They, you know, doing jobs at WWE and then coming back and they, you know, Matt made their own costumes and things like that. Um, yeah, no, I know, I know. And they were, they were like choir boys, man. Really. They were. Cocksucker was the the most Matt would curse yeah. at the time. Yeah. Then they had words that they could say that sounded like cuss words, but weren't cuss words. Yeah, they were goody two shoes. Yeah. It was like wrestling 24 7, so. Yep. Yeah, and you know, they've had their problems, but I think they're clean, like Thomas said, that they're pretty clean right now, clear-headed. Good. So I hope so, because they're two good guys. Yeah, and I hope so. All right, talk about your, a little bit about your early days in ECW. Steve, Steve was there before I was, and he can, he can tell you how he got in there and how his way was getting him for the media yeah. Yeah. with that. Yeah, because Toad's a terrible wrestler. Yeah, yeah, Toad's a terrible wrestler. Love him. I know he's your friend. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought he was well, good. Steve, Steve was already there since this is a you know, shoot about us. Steve was already at ECW before I got there. Yeah. And I got my tryout. Well, it wasn't even a tryout. Toad, a buddy of mine, Toad, got a tryout because his old tag partner, Lodi, who was Raven's sign guy, got it through Raven, through Tommy, to, uh, to get the tryout at ECW. He goes down to ECW, Toe does. I ride down with him. He's ECW's just got his stuff with him. Like, yeah. and there's no, like, not, like, Paul Heyman had no idea. No what clue. C yeah, he had no idea that CWA Anderson was coming. When Toad's in the ring trying out, Steve had just gotten there, and Simon Diamond was there, and Simon, and Steve used to run a promotion in Carolinas down in Rayford and Fayetteville that was NWA 2000, if I'm not mistaken, was yeah. the name of it. Simon would come down, Joey, guys like that, and, you know, work, and I hadn't seen Simon in a while, I hadn't seen Steve in a while, so I was there catching up with him, and Toad has his tryout, and it didn't go so well, and uh, <coughs> Noah gets me in the ring, I start working out, and one thing leads to another, I end up getting to work that night, and if I'm not mistaken, Paul actually asked around, especially asked Steve, because he's only talking to Steve, asked, you know, the C.W. Anderson guy, do you know him, and you know, Steve, uh, whatever that Steve told him, got me a job from there, and it just... Yeah, you know, one of the cool things about CW's tryout was they had tryouts every every show. Like, people would come and try out, and guys would be, some would watch the match, and other people would be bullshitting around and stuff like that. Like, CW got in the ring, and, like, everybody within the first minute just stopped and started watching the match. And, like, it was, like, one of the only times where, like, everybody was, like, captivated on, like, yeah. wow, look at this fucking guy work. And, yeah, it got really quick and, like, right up to Paul. Paul's like, okay, wait, tell me about C.W. Anderson. And then, that's how he brought it up. He's like, tell me about C.W. Anderson. Oh, he's this, I met, you know, he's, he's good, he's good. All right, good. Yeah. I like him. And boom, like, wow. the star is born. Wow. Yeah. And then from there... Um, a lot of time I was traveling by myself. Steve was already traveling. I'm not you know sure. what's funny? I'm sorry I cut you off, but it makes sense. It makes sense because if you're talented, that's how things happen. That's how it's supposed to happen. You know? Yeah. And then it was, it was a while, a few months before I ever got to the point where I started, you know, got back into riding with Steve again. And it was Steve and Jack Victory and, my, <laughs> and Lou 
you know, always traveling, you know, from show to show, going to different places together. And what a way to learn, you know. They talk about, like, going to wrestling school and yeah. you, you get developmental and stuff like that. But the, the two years we had with Jack Victory was, like, not only, like, an education in wrestling, but, like, an education in life. Like, this guy lived the pro wrestling life, the ups, the downs. He, you know, his attitude was, like, something that, like, both me and CW to this day, like, we're like, oh man, Jacko had the greatest attitude yeah. ever. But yeah, Jack Victory was like the coolest thing that we could have ever asked for in ECW. When, when Jack was pissed, he was pissed. But most oh, of the yeah. time, he was had an upbeat personality, always laughing, joking, carry on. He always drove, which was cool. Because me and Steve hate to drive, especially this motherfucker right here. Because <laughs> there was a few times he would get behind the wheel within five minutes. Yeah. He'd be, he'd be narcolepsy or something. He'd be asleep. Jack's like, get your ass out there. And Steve behind the wheel? Back. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So he would, we, me and Steve would always ride in the back, and Jack and Lou would always be in the front. <coughs> and for a minute, you know, it was kind of quiet because they didn't know how to take me being new to the click. And everybody respected Jack, so it's like you never mouthed off to Jack. Yeah. And you never, you never said anything to a veteran. That's what you one of the things you learn. You never yeah. poke fun at him. And Jack always talked about my head. Jack <laughs> always said, you know, how big your head is. Your head so big. Blah blah blah. No one that CW couldn't come back on. Yeah, he always on me. And after about a few months, I had gotten tired of it. <laughs> it gotten old. So one night, everybody knows Jack's got a big ass. I mean, his ass is wide. Huge. It's like three o'clock in the morning, and <laughs> we're walking through a hotel and the hotel's got <laughs> double doors and it's not like they're closed but they're both open so you got 10 feet to walk through and somehow his ass hits one side of <laughs> he keeps walking and out of nowhere I went guess your ass couldn't fit through him could you he looks back and from there on out it was on yeah and there was like this long stare from Jack and he's like staring at CW yeah. we're all like oh. and he, then all of a sudden Jack starts laughing you just knew like it was it was it and from then on out, me and Jack ribbed each other oh. forever. It was one thing after another. And with our traveling clique, you know, a lot of the guys were going out and getting women and stuff like that. Not us. We were the kings of no fun. That's and, not true. We had some fun. Yeah, we did have some fun, which we're getting ready to, you know, to bring up. But most of the nights, if we found a Krispy Kreme donut place. Oh, especially when it was warm. Yeah. We were all about it. We'd run you, run, you, run you off the road to get to that Krispy Kreme. Yeah, we'd hang out with Jack. Jack was a tiger. We would antagonize the yeah. shit out of Lou. Yeah. <laughs> so whenever he'd stop talking. Lou was, Lou was like sometimes psycho. Yeah. And it was loves about, hockey. He yeah, loves hockey to the point of nobody gives a shit. <laughs> and that's for car. Well, I don't care about hockey. Nobody cares. And, you know, whoever his team was and he was talking about it, nobody <laughs> care. And we'd get so mad about hockey because I would always ask him, hey, is Wayne Gretzky still playing with your team? And it's fucking 1999. Nobody yeah, he was, he'd was get pissed. So Lou, like one night or one morning, we wake up, and he's walking around the room with a Krispy Kreme donut on his dick. <laughs> he wakes us up in the morning with a Krispy Kreme donut. Yeah, he had a problem with that. Yeah. Yeah, from the, <laughs> it was something to wear. Like, I have a problem with the cream on the Krispy Kreme donuts. No, I was like, yeah. He would want to sleep naked and like have to show everybody. Yeah. Like, hey, everybody, look at the wake 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 up. Up. <laughs> I had to whip his dick out. <laughs> so, yeah, every 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 morning I was like that with him. Because when we for a while we were sleeping five and six to a room. Yeah. Imagine you had Jack Victory on one bed, Louis Dangerously on the other, and like me and CW. And if we had extras on the floor. Yeah, because Steve, yeah. you know, Steve couldn't sleep on the, the rollaways because they hurt his back. Well, I would sleep on him. And, you know, this guy was like heavyweight champion, sleeping under the sink on the floor. He always slept on the floor. <laughs> always. It was always. Whoa. Another one of the ECW belt. Slept on the floor. Yep. Whoa. Slept on the belt on the floor. Our champ. King of the world. Yeah, that's crazy. But, yeah, like, it, it was you know, rare. Like, there, the was, there was time. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there was times when, uh, yeah, we would go seven to a room, and there was like five guys on the floor. Man, never complained either. It was, it was fun. You won't make any money because if you did make money, you won't get paid for it. Yeah. So you know, there was so many nights that we'd sit after the show knowing we were getting paid, and Paul would sit there and come up with some of the greatest lies known and make you quote unquote drink that Kool Aid of, you know, <laughs> believing what's you know. One night there was a fire in Texas at the hub. Where the, our it, checks were. Yeah, and our checks burned up. And our checks burned up. And oh. like a Dallas hub. 
our checks weren't transported and they were they burned up in a Dallas sub. That was one of the excuses we got one night. One of my favorites <laughs> was Debbie would go, Fed FedEx? Wait, no, no. We said New Orleans. No, why would you send them to Tampa? Oh my god, can you guys believe it? We'd all know it. like she's on the phone with yeah. no one. Wow. One night Ball gets on the phone and they, like Jazz had a problem with her check or something, and he says, I'm "Oh, the FFW check." Yeah, he says, "I'm calling FFW right now." And he gets on the phone and he's talking to whoever it is at FFW, and he's cussing them out, and his phone rings. Why he's supposedly on there cussing the people at FFW out, and Debbie comes up with, "Oh, he's got one of those new phones. brand new phones. Yeah, brand new phones that can ring while he's still on the phone." Uh, I think that's what molded us into like the people we are now, like going <laughs> through like. Stupid, funny shit like that. Yeah. Even though we weren't getting paid, but somehow we would find humor at the end of the, the you, weekend. You had to, because wow. if you didn't, you were going to murder everybody. Oh, wow. wow. we were going crazy. We should have went crazy. Well, I guess we always figured if Jacko didn't go crazy, we yeah. should. Yeah, if Jack, if Jack was, he was our, our saving grace to, to, to some extent with that. This is, we, we, we buy CW. Huh? What, um... That was, how long were you there? Two and a half? I was there uh, November of 98 till. We went down in uh, yeah, 01. Yeah, that was yeah, a, June. I started in June of 99. Yeah. It was a, a great part in our life. Fuck, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was like our seventh <laughs> family. We never got tired of going to work. No, even beat up, you know, because we were balls to the wall every, every show. Like, it didn't matter if a house show, TV, pay per view. Like, everybody's job was to try and steal the show, so we would be banged up, but, man, Thursday would come, it's like, all right, let's pack for the weekend. Yeah, it's time to go again, and it'd be like that. And I mean, every when the holidays were all around like Christmas, we'd get, you know, buy everybody Christmas presents. Yeah. And we, we exchanged gifts and things like that. And the road kill was Santa Claus. Yeah. It, it, and if one night Steve had the best match, I had the best match, some new guy had the best match, you didn't care. You didn't try to put a knife in his back because he stole the show that night. You were yeah, and you him. wanted to work with him. Yeah, you wanted some kind of program with him. So y'all both the way it's supposed the show. to be. Yeah, but yeah, it's, exactly. It was, and the other two, it wasn't like that. At ECW, we were we were literally a family. Yeah. You know, it was saying to, saying hey to everybody, joking and carrying on with everybody, and you yeah. know, saying good night and. And then putting like your lives on the line yeah. every night, man. Some of the stuff that CW and Super Crazy did was. You know, so underrated, but like you go back on it, it's it's stuff that still holds up, you know, nowadays. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, but it was it was fun to learn. You know, the you learned a lot about yourself and life, and you know, because we were in our mid twenties at the yeah. time, uh, our older twenties, and you know, it it was such an education on like how to live a life. You know, do you want to live the wrestler life? You know, you want to. You know, we lived that dream. We but we were the alternative alternative, so we weren't making. Yeah greatest amount of money in the world but we were living so we could live that life as a pro wrestler I, I think the one thing I, I, I want to know if I say I hated it the most but when Bubba and Taz and them were there at 530 your ass better be there in oh, the ring in the ring. Out. there was one day at Winston Salem we, I think we rode with his dad to the show and he got us there like five minutes late and we're running from the car in the arena with our clothes on and diving in the ring to work out. Didn't even get changed. Yeah. Because we were so petrified of bubbling past. That that's how they had it. You asked you guys, you were in the ring. Yeah. Working out. Every till, day. Till the doors opened. And most of the time, I was the first, you know, Steve started out being the first matches and then he started moving up the card. And when I got there, I was the first matches. So you worked out till the doors opened, which was seven o'clock. The show started at eight. You had to go in the back, get towered off, get dressed, to find out who you're working. And nine times out of ten, you didn't find out who you were working until ten minutes to eight. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know how Paul would do it, being as, as genius as he is. But he would put together the lineup at, at ten of eight. And he'd be like, all right, that's what we're doing. And we'd be like, all right, you know, let's all get it together real quick. So it, it's funny. People talk about, like, how great ECW was. To think, like, it was not too over choreographed because of you know we didn't know who we were sometimes we would get to a pay-per-view didn't know who we were working no and it because it would change some night there was um like anarchy rules 2000 what do you think didn't know uh, didn't know didn't know who we were working and we get there and find out that we're working each other yeah let me ask you a question 
being being that you made that comment, what do you th- you you think that's a benefit? You think it was you rather do it that way, or you rather have known who you was coming to work with? Um, I don't know. If, you know, now it, I think it prepared us to be thinkers. Yeah, yeah. Not only were we putting our lives on the line out there, but we had to think about it because you know we didn't have time to create like a whole thing. Yeah, you know, it was go out there and do what you can do and your strengths and you know getting over the other guy's strengths. And, and that was the one thing that Paul knew how to do more than anything was like get the most out of somebody. Yeah. You, you look at Public Enemy or guys that like were ECW guys. They would go to the different companies and then shit the bed. And you'd be like, what happened? And like, you realize like, wow, how good Paul was to, he could get the most out of somebody, you know, that other companies wouldn't be able to. Yeah, I like the, the fact of, of not knowing to some, to some extent, because if you sit there and you, you work on a match for too long, you, you, you don't feel it when you get in there personally. You go in there and you just basically go through the motions. And that's why when people say our stuff's choreographed, that's the whole point of choreographing to me is, these guys that know, like me and Steve are going to work each other a month out. We go through and, you know, we walk through it and walk through it so many times. So when we're in the ring, it feels like we're walking through it still instead of being alive. Yeah, there, somebody fucks up. It's yeah, it's trouble. Bad. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, they, uh, with, the, with the stuff with that is at 10 minutes, you know, till, you just, like you said, you just go out there and wing it. It's just like I said for our Anarchy Rules match. In 2000 in Minneapolis, we find out we're working each other and we're excited about it. So we go out there and we plan on it and uh, we come up with some great spots. And if you go back and watch this match, you know, in the beginning, Steve always, he always bragged to me about, <laughs> you know, I, I, man, I'm so good at not fucking up spots. The opening spots I'm really good at, I can remember, because our opening spot was... You'll really never hear you fucked up chance. Yeah, you'll never hear me fucked up chance because I never fuck up the opening spot. And we had a long <laughs> opening spot. So we're going through in the match, and I'm coming off the ropes for a spot. And, and granted, we have gone over this this whole sequence 15 times in the back. And we had it. When we down, had it, yeah. Down, there was down, no down, way down. that I could fuck this no up. No way you could fuck it up. And I'm coming off the ropes, and I'm expecting him to be dropped down, and he's up for a duck to elbow. And I went blank. He went blank, and it was a deer in headlights, and I hear, holy fuck. So <laughs> Live on pay-per-view, I just go, oh, fuck. So I'm, I'm trying to take over, and he's trying to fight me back. So we go through the motions, and I'm telling him what to do, and he's still trying to fight me back So because he fucked up the spot. He bragged about this shit the whole time. If you watch it, it's in the opening one. We go through the sequence. I snap uh, yeah, him over, I or leg trip him or something. I stomp him right in the throat. Right. Through. And I knew it as soon as he did it. I'm like, ah, oh, I fucked Just up. Just for fucking up. I yeah. stomped him right in the throat. Oh, I Four. couldn't believe it. And you yeah. know what? How cool the ECW fans were. What happened? Huh? Nothing. We went through yeah, the rest right. of the night. No, I didn't hear. Oh, oh man. He just made it. Made it. <laughs> <known. laughs> like, just I made it known that he fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And the, the, the worst part was that the ECW fans were so cool to us. That's how we knew we were over. Yeah. They even gave us like a at the end, and I'm like, oh, and I'm laying there with my throat hurt. I'm like, man. CW's gonna be fucking hot at me because I'm in there with like my best friend, and, and I had to take a chair shot from him later. And all I kept thinking was, oh, he's gonna get me back for fucking up. <laughs> and again, yeah, I did because I took out him and the camera <laughs> chair shot on that spot. Oh, it ended up really good, but yeah, that's a, being in there with your best friend. We beat the brakes oh, off each other. And the, you know, the cool thing is that we were realizing that. Man, here we are live on pay per view where like two years ago we were on the indies hoping for the shot. Yeah. Here we are like best buddies, like we're against each other on pay per view. How fucking cool is and it this? It was like for the number one contender spot for the belt. That's right when he, you know, they were pushing him to get the belt. So it was, it was, it was good because he went over that night. But it was nice to know that I'm in there again with my best friend for the number one contender spot, and we're in front of. You know, it was a packed yeah, house like in Minneapolis. 10, it was packed at Minneapolis and you know we had a good time in there just beating the crap out of it. And it was cool because they knew I was starting to get that run to the top where in CW was still the mid card guy, but they stayed into it the whole time thinking like, you know, sometimes people are like, oh that guy's getting the push, he's gonna win. Man, it they 
it was 50 50 they were yeah. like they didn't know who was going on yeah that. and it, it was so cool like to watch it now like how into everything like spine buster oh you know the punch oh and you get those false finishes and here we are like man this is this is what we do this yeah, for and this is why we're here paul was happy he was mad at my beard that night yeah. i remember that so with the thick beard you're a baby face I'm like i don't know like <laughs> Makes me uh, crazy. I know. Can you speak about um, riding, rooming, arrangement for Jack and Lou? Well, they were promoters. They 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 did local promotions, so yeah. um, they were like technically office employees too. So they got their hotel paid for, and which is another reason we slept on the the floor is uh, because if we stayed with Jack and Lou, we didn't have to pay for a room, but you had to like pay your dues and sleep yeah. on the floor. You didn't have to pay for the car rental either. But yeah, exactly. So that saved us so much money, you know, every week. Yeah. And uh, the money we weren't getting paid. Yeah, true. Yeah. And you know, Jacko, like we went in, and like, Jacko was so cool, like teaching us stuff, you know, because he he'd been in so many different aspects of, of the wrestling business. So yeah. he was so much fun to, to ride with. But I mean, it could be like drinking, it could be like rats or anything like that. Jack had the best advice. Um, remember when he punched out the guy in Chicago? At the, the bar. bar. At the bar, right? And we yeah. all thought we were dead. Yeah. We're in the shady part of Chicago, and Chicago is Jack's town. But, like, we started at a bar, uh, at a bar called Shady's, and we shifted to one called Shifty's. Man, these are pretty shady fucking bars. Yeah. And we're all sitting there, and we're all drinking, but, like, Jack's hammered. <clears throat> and some guy is not leaving Jack alone. And we're like, all right, it's time to go. And Jack Victory, like a movie, takes finishes his drink, Puts it down, turns, punches the guy out, and then like fucking four horsemen, we walked right out of the bar. Yeah, and just left. All right, we go. All I kept thinking was, "Oh my god, we're gonna get killed." <laughs> yeah, he he was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was good learning from Jack because he's one of the, <laughs> he's the first veteran I was ever around, and I was like, he's definitely a different style of the veteran. Uh, one one of my first times after uh, I got divorced, one of my first rats in ECW was in Buffalo, and uh, I was rooming with Jack. You were with Lou right. in the other room, and this girl was pretty, but like we were worried that she might have been young. So like Jack played the old off all sleep in the bed thing, and man, I was fucking hammered, like hammered time. And I'm like Jack, I don't know. I don't think she's old enough. I don't think she's old enough. He <laughs> literally grabs me by the shirt and goes, "You don't do this." We're done. This is it for us. He's like, you're gonna do this, and you're gonna do this like a man. I'm, yes, sir. What is it with you and young girl? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so the, so it's the king, moniker. I guess so. Remember so Australia? I we're mean, doing it, and I'm doing that, right? I remember that went bad too. Uh, so we're we're like doing, it and she goes, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm so con concerned, and I don't know what made us do it, but she leaves to go to the bathroom. Me and Jack meet minds and like between beds, we turn on a light and we rifle through her purse. Not for money, not for anything. We're looking what? for ID. <laughs> and like all of a sudden we hear her flush and we're like rolling around. Like, we're like, oh my god, we didn't get to see it. So there, there's, there's one night we were in New Orleans party <laughs> and I don't know where Jack was. I think he was out or something. He went missing that day. Yeah, he yeah. Was. Everybody, we go into New Orleans together as a group. And all of a sudden, I come back to the hotel room, and it's just me and Lou. No Steve, no Jack. No you guys Lou. fucking left me. Uh, yeah, West Park, what it was. was no, they back. left me. We went in, like we went to Bourbon Street. Yeah. Somehow we met up with Balls. And Kid Cash. And Kid Cash. Yeah. No, I didn't see Kid Cash at this point. Oh, okay. So we started drinking like Hurricanes or something like that. The next thing I know, I'm in a car, and I'm with two girls, and I turn, and I see Kid Cash. I'm like, I go, when the fuck did you get here? He goes... He goes, we picked, you guys, we picked you guys up. I'm like, where's everybody else? He goes, you two are alone. It was like me and some girl. Yeah. I'm like, they fucking left me. Yeah, because me, me, me and Lou didn't really drink. So we come back and we leave Steve on, we're in the bed and Steve's on this hot dog roll. Okay. Yeah, they left a kid's cot. I think, I think we're getting the signal to take a break. When, yeah. when you hear what these fuckers did to me, it's pretty bad. All right, I want to thank you for that quick couple of stories. Um, we'll be back in a few with NoKFaden.com part two. Come back.
Okay, welcome to part two of OKFamer.com with Steve Carino, CW and Anderson, former ECW legends in my eyes. All right, we're going to continue speaking about ECW. Yeah, right. right. When, when we left off, we were talking about the famous, we call it the hot dog roll night. And yeah, it's bullshit. Because <laughs> it was bullshit because he was involved in it, but we thought, me and Lou thought it was funny as hell. So anyway, to catch people back up, we were in New Orleans, we left Steve. We get back, Steve brings they a They left me. Yeah, we left him. <laughs> they left me <laughs> in a city all by myself. In New Orleans, more or less. I'm like, yeah. yeah. We were drinking, so we was coming back. So anyway, we come back, finally. He's didn't know where we were staying. He stumbles in the room with this rat. And for the people <laughs> oh, that don't know that, it's like a woman that's a groupie that hangs out with wrestlers and whatnot. We call them rats. Okay. Everybody has their own Oh, turmoil. she was awful. <laughs> oh, yeah, she was, she was Toe up from the floor. Oh, she's bad. She, we left Steve with like this kid <laughs> cot. It was only about this big, and it rolled. It looked like an upside down hot dog roll. Like my ass would hang over it. That's yeah. how bad and small she, it was. She, plus, she had to fit on it too. <laughs> so me and Slu were laying in our beds, and the gimmick is if you bring a girl back, the other one's got to be asleep. So yeah. when because the girl always said, I'm not doing it because they're not asleep. And you're like, yes, they are. Let, 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 sh- <laughs> they're hard sleepers. They're hard sleepers. You hear somebody go, <laughs> <laughs> and they're not asleep. We're just making it up. So we're sitting there watching it because the way the moon lights in, she starts going to work. Oh, she was fucking phenomenal. She is on him. She is. She uh, doesn't care that there's yeah. five people <laughs> riding in. And, she's there, and me and Lou are laying there asleep. And I'm like knocking on the. We're doing Morse code on the like little freaking kids. Why? <laughs> and I'm looking. I'm like, I turn. I'm like, ah. Oh, we're these watching. Two are watch. We're watching. We're just like. Yeah. <laughs> Thumbs uh, up. And we're going, can't fame, can't fame. And he's, yeah, she. She didn't care. She no, did not. She was, she was in her own world. Yeah, she went. She went in there. It's like people that's inside <laughs> cars and pick their nose. They don't care who's around them. She was like, she didn't care who watched. She went to town on my boy here. Which, oh. which that wasn't as bad as in September of 1999. <laughs> in Charlotte, North Carolina, we were doing a show. I, had, I hadn't even been there a couple months. and But his first night in, he became a legend. Yeah, the first, okay, we'll go back to that. My first night in, I'm on the road which with Which leads him. this next story. I, I come <laughs> in, and these two girls that used to roll around the Indies and Carolinas <laughs> with me, and some of the other boys, they came to one of our shows, so we brought them. I brought they were them famous too. Yeah, we brought. They actually did. We're in Spin Magazine, but um, we brought. I brought them back to my hotel room one night, and first night. Yeah, we caught. We called them Hoss and Little Joe from like <laughs> Bonanza, because one was a big old girl and the other was Jeez. small and skinny. Yeah. And so Hoss hooks up with Skull Von Crush, Big Vito, Big Vito, La Grassa. And they're doing her thing, and me and her are laying on the cot that's pushed up next to Steve's bed. And of course, I had a full bed. I had seniority. Yeah, he had seniority. <laughs> said we had the cot pushed up here, and Steve was asleep while me and her were fooling around, and she was. And like, I'm a back sleeper. Yeah, he always sleeps with his back turned like this, and she goes, she's fooling me and her doing things. She's giving me head, hitting blah blah. And like out of nowhere, you know, because I'm a giver, I'm not a taker. And I said, look, why don't you go hook my boy up? And I, I swear, I'm thinking, I must be fucking dreaming today. Yeah, just hear this. Me. Yeah. And I'm like, hook my boy up. I'm like, I didn't just hear this tonight. And have you ever seen the movies where you see the animal move through the sheets underneath? That's all you see. Oh, that she did it. I don't know how my shorts came off. Oh, she like worked magic. <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden, like she, she starts going to town. I'm thinking, wow, wow this CW is just fucking awesome. Wow. So she's, but I'm she's, thinking, where is he? Because <laughs> he's moving like this, and while she's polishing his oh. <laughs> I'm going to open his eyes, and I'm behind her hitting, and I'm going, wow. <laughs> So that became a thing. Like if you had, if you yeah. had girls in the room, you had to hit the poses. So, oh my a couple God. months later, these girls were champs, man. They were good girls, oh, and they, they, they rolled the score. They, too. they come and hung out with us. Around September of 1999, uh, it was Hurricane Floyd come through North Carolina. Yeah, it was yeah. big. Destroyed a whole bunch of shit. So we were running shows down in the Charlotte area, the ECW, and one night 
we go back to the room and they come and I was like, look, y'all come hang out with us, we'll go party. They were like, all right, cool. So we go back to the room, but this was one of those nights that we had like seven in the room. There was seven dudes in the room with us and them two girls. We had cases of beer. We started hitting the beer. Everybody starts getting fucked up. Everybody starts getting drunk. They get naked. And all of us guys. Girls, I could see. You know, no, no. She looked like a can of popping biscuits. T- <laughs> so she, they both yeah. get naked and we start beating the, beating the hell out of these guys. Yeah, we started wrestling them. Yeah, well, like, I, we had the advantage. One of them, I chopped one of them. Oh. Super kick. Him and another guy 3D'd one and completely missed, missed the, bed. the bed. Yeah, her face, like, hit the floor. And they got up more and more. That was what it was. So there was six of us and two of them. <laughs> and they went to town. And we went to town, too. Now, no. And what started this, because wasn't just a few months before, the whole Omega crew had the Survivor Series on yeah, those Yeah, 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 yeah. And Survivor we said, series. wait, what's, what's the Survivor Series? And it was, it was like five on two. And if you came, you were eliminated. You were out. And we're like, what the fuck? And I, I think it was CW goes, <laughs> but we got seven. <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah. we called we're it. like, we can beat that. <laughs> and we did. We called it Hurricane Floyd. Hurricane <laughs> Floyd. So oh, was, we in there. It was fucking ridiculous. Oh God, yeah, God. Why, one of, it was two beds. They would be bent in doggy style position, giving head, getting hit from behind. <laughs> oh. And we'd switch positions. It got to the point where they couldn't get blowjobs because our mouths were so numb from the rubber. Yeah. The kind of and there was rubbers everywhere. It was like, like fucking landmines <laughs> everywhere. And. I'm sitting here calling the girl's name. I said, don't you like this? Don't you like this? She says, my name is this. I'm like, yeah, what the what, fuck ever. Yeah, whatever. And oh. so one of the other guys, he's Debauchery. Been, he, he's a veteran. He says, boys, I'm going to show you how to do it. He goes ahead and blows it in her mouth, and he taps out. He We're, goes, all right, I'm out. <laughs> We're filming this. I had yeah, to get somebody's report. got it for video. Yeah, got somebody's it. got it for video. It still if any of us ever back. get big yeah, money, uh, we're, we're not, all in trouble. Absolutely not. But <laughs> I had the gimmick recorder where I was recording them. And at the end of the night, one of them goes and she's late. She wants to like lay and cuddle with Steve or something. Steve has no part of it. Well, By the way, I won. Yeah, he for won. those he was, that are wondering, yeah, he was the last one. <laughs> he was the last one. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. she always she tells me like can survive. Right? <laughs> the, 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 the night before she goes and sleeps with the ring crew, and they beat her with a kendo <laughs> stick. Be, yeah, the, I mean literally like smacked her in the back with the kendo yeah. stick. I took a banana and put a condom on it, and was biting her with the banana and the condom. <laughs> so she's laying down there with us, and we're like making fun of her, <laughs> and she's like. Well, I'm going to go stay with Hazel then because they, they make love to me. I said, well, get your ass up there, you big fat moose. <laughs> so, the other one stayed and said, like, she uh, like, had special time with Steve because her and Steve would go in the bathroom and she let Steve get it. Woman, like, oh, yeah. yeah. She was, she that's was just, a champ. That's like down, must be the most down to earth woman in the world. Yeah, she, she, was, <laughs> she was really young and she's grown up a lot, but yeah. During that time, and I won't mess with a woman. That was, like that's not my style. That bro. was cool. That was a it good. Just that was, sounds like that was yeah. a woman. I hope my son never watches <laughs> this video. Yeah, that, see that night. I was, was just thinking, like your wife. I hope she don't watch this video. There was a there was a few minutes. It's stuff that happened in my past. Stuff that happened in his past. It's something I can't change. Yeah. She was no angel before she met me. You know, he yeah. was no angel. I, I'm, I'm no, sure I'm I've never angel. killed a girl. You married? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was married twice. It so, didn't work. I married the two meanest women in the entire universe. <clears throat> hey, you did. Right? I can't even say U.S. In, in both countries, which we'll talk about that. Oh, but fuck, right? That, that was, that was an interesting night because I hadn't been there long, but some of the guys that went there, me and this guy, we, we like bonded. I mean, we, we become close because we were working each other a lot at the time. And uh, we, it, it was a bonding experience because I brought him in and, and shared. I shared the wealth. So, and uh, that was that, that was pretty much a good, a good good night for us. Yeah, man, we were living like rock stars. Yeah. Mm. Holy shit. Yeah. So, so uh, what's the We didn't one? do drugs, so that was the crazy thing. Yeah, we didn't do, we didn't yeah. drug. I think we were, like, so interested in just, like, man, living the life and, man, it, it sometimes getting some yeah. ass. No. So. Jack, you know what? Jack was one of those guys that, like, lived that life and 
he, he like if he wanted to do it, it was cool, but like he wouldn't want us to do it. So yeah, it was, it was like, like almost a father figure. To yeah, us. take care of us like that. Exactly. Like if we didn't see Jack do it, we weren't going to do it. Uh, not at all. Cool. And if and if he was going to do it, he was going to do it away from us. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was it was cool because we we're like, all right, man, if our mentor isn't going to do it, then yeah, we're not going to. Yeah. We respected him that much and respected him that that we weren't going to do anything like that. I heard you mention Bobo was one of the guys training. How was how long he was in the business before y'all came in? You don't know. He was at ECW from well, probably the closest. I won't say the beginning, but he come around at that time. But he yeah, was only the there. Y'all came like that. Yeah. Was the end of it. He left. For me, he left about three months after I was there. Him and Taz. Man, he was tough mm. to get. He was tough to get along. With. Yeah, yeah. At the time, he was. Oh. A, you hear that a lot, Bobo. Yeah, he's not the. You know. The, t the Bubba he was at ECW was not the Bubba that Steve and I wrestled a few years back. Right? We were, yeah, you know, he was so tough on us. He was, he was like, real tough on us we for like, no reason, fuck man. Fuck this guy. Well, yeah, we were trying to be be nice and respectful. Like, he would always just shit on us. And uh, we ended up wrestling him, what, about four years ago? Yeah. Me and CW were preparing to go in like, this is our fight, you know, we're yeah. going to have to fight Bubba. Because Devon's one of the coolest guys in the entire world, mm -hmm. but we're like Bubba doesn't respect us. He shits on us all the time, and man, we were pleasantly surprised. I was like, holy shit! So, um, anyway, yeah, you know, Bubba was yeah he was totally wanted to work with us, and they even changed the match on us before, and we're like we. We just adapted. He didn't realize, and he kept saying, "He's like, I didn't know you guys were this good." And yeah. I'm like, well, Bubba, if you would have just like watched and asked, yeah. you know, we probably could have made money with them in TNA. Yeah. yeah. No, we could have. We, we, we can make money with anywhere we go, but people yeah. won't give us a chance because one, we don't like kissing people's asses. And I would. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, no. Fucking sell out. Yeah, you know, you just give us a chance. We're never going to have the great bodies, yeah, but we can work great. circles around most tag teams out there now, the way I look at it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You ever work TNA? You? Or you? Yeah, not not like long term, but yeah, here's shots here and there. Shot. Yeah. I don't know if I've Yeah. Yeah. I've worked there before. So. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I, I watched the. Uh, they were available. Right now, but not working. They were available. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm All right. Sorry. I'm Jeff, call me. What was your next question? What's the no one cared match? <laughs> that was this match was right after Steve had become heavyweight champion. His first title defense was against me and Schenectady, New York. And it should have been cool. We were ushering a new generation of champions. Yep. First title defense against you know the guy that was in the number one contender match. Good story, right? Yeah, it was perfect. Oh setting. fuck. Yeah, it was then right about that time as. Scott Hubble came and was making his name or and known at ECW right at the end. Yeah, it leaked that Scott Hall was the big surprise for Schenectady and everybody and the main event. knew it. And we were the semi main event. Oh, uh, no one cared. We come out to do the match and nobody give a rat's ass about what we did. All they wanted, they were can't skip, uh, kept chanting Scott, Scott Hall. Hall. Yeah. They were wanting that because they knew he was the, going to be the big surprise for the next match. So we were, literally went out there and did a match where just nobody could have cared oh, less. We, we were, were trying so hard to. Yeah. Yeah. They finally, just didn't give I a shit. I finally looked at him and said, dude, nobody gives a damn. Well, let's, yeah. let's take it home. It was this connected. It was right near the end of the ECW. I don't remember oh, yeah. the date yet. Yeah, yeah that, was my, that was my first impression as being the new champion. Yeah. No one gave a fuck about our match. So it, it was right after that. Um, we went to Canada. That was the night that Tommy told me that they're gonna take the belt off me the next day because no one gave a shit about us. Yeah, well, it wasn't our fault. But it was, it was <laughs> right after Tommy. that we went to Canada. It was like our only appearance in Canada, our largest house crew, house house crowd, and we were supposed to get all our back pay and stuff that night. Because yeah, here we are, seven thousand people. There's twenty bucks a head. You know, they got. Yeah, they got the was money. Our night. And we were gonna get our back pay made up. It was that night. Paul sits us down. For one of his another uh, drink the Kool Aid speeches about how we're not getting paid, and the reason we were getting paid this night is because the money was in Canadian, and he couldn't take it back over the border in Canadian. Which I roast my hand. I said, <laughs> I'm Canadian. I can take ten thousand over the border. Mm -hmm. Pin drop. 
Nobody said a word. Yeah. You uh, Canadian? Huh? You Canadian? I'm Canadian, yeah. Really? So, <laughs> so uh, oh, fucking Paul was so mad at me. Whoa. You're supposed to be a leader. <laughs> Why would you say that? It'd go against me. It was pretty much he didn't have the money. That was going to be his excuse. And shortly thereafter, ECW went by the bike side. Mm. I shouldn't have spoke up. <laughs> Cody would have still been there. Because that is the same, he was giving us the speech that night. I'm in at Los Angeles. I'm trying to work out a deal with USA to get us back on TV. I swear on my mother's eyes and grave and whatever wow. that I'm in Los Angeles working on a deal to get you back on USA. He was out there in Los Angeles filming the movie Rollerball. Which wasn't a very good movie. So before yet. that, all the times, like, all the good times, I know. I know the crowd and the environment means a lot when you be in these events. So, you know, the money didn't matter at the time. But how was the pay during that time that you say you enjoyed it and things like that? Me? Yeah. Wasn't good. I started out making 75 bucks a night, and at the end I was making 200 bucks a night. Whoa. Steve was making more, but I wasn't. Yeah. Even even on the last pay-per-view, my equipment match, I never got paid for. So my pay was shit. And you? Uh, my, my pay was good on paper. You know, I, uh, I started out at 75 and then 150 and then I was on a, uh, excuse me, a uh, $600 a week guarantee. And then I had that match with um, uh, Tajiri. Hard for him. Yeah, and they, they put me and Tajiri up to 1500 a week. And wow. then uh, after I had a bloodbath with Jerry Lynn at the next pay per view, they wrote a new contract for two thousand a week. Really? I saw two thousand once. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. Steve Carino making a hundred thousand dollars. I never saw it even close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's it like in, in Japan? The S and M. The um. Japan. Japan. Oh, oh, Japan was. And then the rest of my thing, we were, we were more over in Japan and oh. getting there, but J Japan and all was a better place because we were there a lot longer than ECW. Yeah. Um, Steve got there from Japan because he was the NWA heavy world. When ECW went down, Steve was doing anything. He became the NWA world heavyweight champ. And how was it you got set up with your match with Hashimoto? For people who don't know Shinya Hashimoto. NWA. Yeah. yeah, the NWA Heavyweight Champion, and the boss of Zero One was Shinya Hashimoto, who was a freaking legend, like Muda and Huge, those guys. Yeah, at least one of the three Musketeers, him, Chono, Muda. Yeah. So, and then he's got this worker match where it was him and Steve in the States, right? Yeah, it got me my job because um, they wanted to do a DQ finish, or they wanted to do a finish to put the belt on Hashimoto. Right. But they, they knew it was so obvious that Hashimoto was going to win. They were trying to figure out ways. And I came up with this way of manipulating the kayfabe sheets and, like, the Internet real quick. So about a week before this match happened, I, uh, I asked everybody in the, the, the NWA, uh, I said, give me the finishes to all your matches. So they were like, okay, every, nothing was going to change. So I said, all right, what you got to do is email this to all the like news sites and say, hey, here's the finishes for tonight's show. Please don't release them until like 10 o'clock, right? So now all these internet sites have like quick news. They could just throw it up there. So everything was right until me and Hashimoto's match. And you, the, the finish of me and Hashimoto that was sent to the internet was Karino beats Hashimoto by disqualification. Like re referee interference or something like that. But at the show, what we did was, um, I, I'm a huge Rocky Balboa fan. So mm -hmm. we had a thing where something happened, Hashimoto pops me over the eye, catches me above the eye. Uh, and I, you know, my, my eye's bleeding. And all of a sudden, he won't let it go. And he just starts kicking the shit out of me, like literally kicking me in the face, you know, as a shoot, making it look like he's getting the belt off me no matter what. And um, yeah, the referee had to stop it. But in the, in the, the the referee Fred uh, Rubenstein was so like really concerned. He kept like saying to me, "He's like, you know, you have a kid at home. Don't. This isn't worth it. Don't do this." And he said it quiet enough that like 
it was like a shoot, but some people heard it in the in the front row that he was sitting. So everybody's like, "Oh my God, this just broke into like a shoot," and it worked so well. And I wrote the whole thing that it, yeah, I got into the office. So when I was working in the office with zero one, like they first said, oh, "Who's your favorite tag team partner?" I'm like, "Fucking C W Anderson." <laughs> yeah, so they brought C W over and. They put us together right away. The first night in against uh, first the first match was Frankie Kazarian and Nova. Right, and right. Did it. And then the second night, we were Hashimoto and Fujiwara in this sold out place. And when Steve and I come in, the crowd's hot. But when Fujiwara and Hashimoto hit the ring, it was like Hogan and The Rock. Oh the wow! They like people just mobbed them. And Fujiwara is like an old like shooter and stuff yeah. like real famous. And Hashimoto like. It took them like five minutes to get to the ring because people were like hugging them so much. Yeah, they get in the ring, they get the flowers and the ovation, and they commenced to beating the shit out of us in that match. Especially me, because I'm the new guy. They beat me. The first time Hashimoto hit me was with a knife edge chop oh. across the face. He hit me, and I went, I saw stars. And then he kicked me in the chest, and it's like getting kicked by a mule by this guy. Yeah. So, but. I went. One thing that I was told was to go to their ass. Don't let them get the the best of you. And I did. I went to Hashimoto's ass. Like we get Hashimoto in the corner for the first time, I start well on his ass, chopping him. Steve, literally, you see Steve on camera looking at me, go, "What the hell are you doing?" Yeah, I go, "He's the boss." <laughs> I'm like beating the hell out of him. And the, um, the finish was original DDT, which was a brain buster. Brain buster. And it's Ooh. not like the brain busters here where they lay you down. It literally take you straight down. And the first thing that hits is the back of your head. You're like, you're you're like, you're like oh yeah, you like, you like yeah, accordion yourself. Is yeah, I didn't realize I could suck my own dick until I was back. Yeah, you realize how flexible you are there. Yeah. Yeah. And after that match, the the boss, you know, the, 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 Hashimoto was the boss, but Nakamura was the booker. Hashimoto was telling him to make sure that I came back, and so they brought me back, you know, time in and time out, you know, working with this guy. Um, oh man, do we have some fun? Yeah. We did the 18 foot tag rope one night. Yeah, we do a match where Steve and I, our gimmick was we were kind of comedy in the beginning and sometimes during the match. But when it comes pretty to much like the, the way they, they would explain it to me, it's like we were gentlemen outside the <laughs> ring and we were like real nice guys. Yeah. But in the ring, we were really dirty and people couldn't understand why, or we couldn't understand why people wouldn't cheer us. Right. And it came off like a, like a comedy thing and it, it worked so well for us. Yeah, so I'm getting my ass kicked in the corner one night and the crowd starts laughing because the tag rope, Steve attaches his tape to the tag rope. You know, you're not supposed to let go of the tag rope. And he's unwinding 18 foot of tape. I had a whole roll of tape on my wrist. I looked like I was wearing like a big wristband, like a big wristband. To get down to make the tag on me. See, it was, it was little things like that that got us over that made us one of the most, if not the most popular gaijin tag team in, in Japan over there. Um, we, we traveled, it seemed like, everywhere. You know, we were doing the, the uh, bullet train, planes in the beginning, then it got to a point where we were on the bus. We were uh, we were over in most towns. There's some yeah. towns we're not allowed to go back to. Because um, Mr. Unsportsmanlike conduct over here. <laughs> I guess I guess, yeah that, I'm, I guess we're talking about the baseball stuff. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And it caused an international incident. Well, first time. Well, all right. Was it a don't know? When I come out of high school, I was drafted by the Padres as a catcher because I have a very strong arm. Um, he fucking does. <laughs> and still to the day, I got a strong arm. But we pull up. One day, we, we leave at 11 o'clock and go to the building. 30 minutes later, we're at the building, which we couldn't figure out why in the hell we had to leave. No one could, because we were all like sleeping over, sleeping off hangovers. Yeah. So anyway, we get out, and we see a Japanese Little League team practicing, which me and Steve, we always took our gloves when, yeah. he, could, when he could remember it. And we always <laughs> played ball. Remember ball. we left them in the van? Or the, yeah, we got to the point where we'd leave them under the, the bus. bus. Um, so we had the bus driver go ask the guy, hey, can these guys come play with y'all? And are like, yeah, no problem. And we could never understand the bus driver. Like, he didn't even speak Japanese. He spoke like gibberish. Yeah, we didn't know what it was. It was like hand him. signals. Yeah. So we go out and we start practicing with this, with this little league team. Well, Steve takes over at shortstop, and I go out in the outfield while they're doing batting practice and whatnot. And, and I used to be a good ball player in high school. They, they, they're doing game situations. So there's a guy on first one time, and there's a ball hit to the shortstop, which is Mr. Carino over here. 
and they go turn two. When he gets it, he bobbles it. And he can't make the play at second. It's nervous. <laughs> to a little Japanese boy, journey. he don't really say anything. He goes back. What's gone he first? Gave me the eye though. He, he gave me like a little eye, bit of an eye. But he didn't say anything yet. So the next play, the guy hits it to shortstop again with one Same out. exact play. Like so, what do you do? Same, oh. Yeah. What do you do? You turn two at the middle and you get out of the end. And Steve takes the ball. He goes to turn two and throws that some bitch in right field. The little yeah. boy that was at second base starts cussing him in Japanese. Yeah, boy, Baki, I don't know. It's, I know what you're saying to me. Yeah. As he's walking off. So, Steve couldn't believe he's getting cussed out. Well, about the point he throws it in right field, I get the ball and throw a line shot from right field to home plate, which the guy, the coaches were like, holy shit. Um, right after that, they asked me to start throwing batting practice. We pitched batting practice to, to, to people. Okay. So, I start, I get on the mound, I start warming up. Uh, and Steve's the first. It's supposed to be batting practice, not pitching practice. Yeah, I take it like it's the World Series because I'm a little competitive when I get on the baseball field. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Steve's the first one to get up there. I throw three three strikes at him. I said, "Well, how are they looking?" And his response was, "They sound good." Yeah. I don't know. I ain't seen them yet. They sound good. Shit, man. <laughs> I'm like so happy that he didn't hit me with these pitches because, <laughs> man, he was throwing so fast that like. All you could hear was the sizzle go by. You're like, what the hell is this? So the, the coaches get up next. I throw them by them. They maybe make a contact here and there. Takawa gets up, um, who's like my Japanese brother. He looks like, like a the, tough guy, too. Yeah. And he gets up on top of the plate, like crowds the plate. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, I brush no. him back. Otani gets up, and he goes, <laughs> oh, more slow, please. <laughs> so I had to slow him down for him. Then, Still couldn't catch up to him. Um, this 16-year-old kid gets up. Like the coach's bigger son. Yeah, the coach's older son gets up. I throw a few by him. I start getting fancy. And, and and people are getting upset, too, because there's no action because he keeps striking everybody out. So no one's hitting the ball. We're just all just standing out there. <laughs> so I start getting a little cocky, and I used to be able to throw a hell of a knuckleball. Well, I throw a knuckleball, and it don't knuckle. For people who don't know, when the ball don't knuckle, it's just a slow fastball. This kid crushes it. Fucking crushes And everybody pops. Everybody. Which is <laughs> except for me. It pissed me off. And I'm like celebrating because I'm like, wow, this kid just hit the thing. And I'm like, yeah. And all of a sudden, he turns around to shortstop and his face is bright red. And I'm thinking, oh no, this is good. And I watch him <laughs> stare at the kid running the bases. I'm like, oh god, what's going to happen next? The kid stands up and gets in the batter's box again. And you just see CW, he's like, and they're like, you know in the movies when something bad's gonna happen, you're like, no, that's what was happening in my mind. And I'm thinking, oh God, CW winds up, throws the pitch right in the middle of the kid's back. I beamed the kid right in the back. I mean, it was, wow. it fucking knocks the kid down, right? We're practicing. He gets all hot and then like, Bows up to everybody, like, yeah, because everybody's like, oh, yeah. The only one that pops is Otani. <laughs> Otani goes, woo! All the wrestlers are watching it with this, oh my god, what just happened? Yeah, like, they had to get us off the field because he had so much heat. Even that night, the crowd shows up, and I usually get cheers. I got booed that night. Yeah, and the house was up because, like, it got around to this little town that how the big bad round eye man just you know took down Japan's hopes and dreams one more time. It was oh, oh it was crazy. We got in the ring, and like usually you get in the ring, and they'll give you like a little bit of applause anytime CW stepped through those ropes. <laughs> boo! <laughs> like oh, he was he was the villain of the village that night. Yeah. So I guess when we come back, since we got up, we got a little bit more to go on with that. We'll be back, part three, no kfavor.com, CW and Steve Carino. All right, we back, part three, no kfavor.com with CW and Steve Carino. Welcome back. Can we speak about who's the workhorse? Yeah. Yes. Can you speak about the workhorse and the talker? That... That's uh, what he and I have come up with, or uh, we've always talked about that. Every tag team has to have their little, has to have who their little roles. 
Yeah. And for me and Steve, he's always the talker. When it comes to getting on the mic, cutting back at somebody, running down a crowd, you know, getting the crowd amped up or against us, that's the man for you right there, Steve. Yeah. You know, when it comes to the workhorse part, who's putting in the load and, you know, this, that, another, that's me. You know, it's not taking nothing away from Steve. I mean, the man, you know, like you said, the man's a beast in the ring. Yeah. You've seen the things he can do in the ring. But it, it seems like it's always been me that's the workhorse part of it, you know, because then Anderson always, always been a workhorse. Um, that's the thing. I think that's what they knew in Japan, too, that, yeah. you know, they were going to get the quality match out of you. Like, yeah. I was the entertainment part of the, the tag team. And he was the sports part. And yeah. he was he was the guy that was go, go, go. Always. So yeah. that's what's like, I seen you in ROA, so your style in ECW, because I never really watched ECW too much. I used to catch it here and there. I was a big fan, but I never got to catch it much. So your style was different, because I see you go hard in ROH. Yeah, so a little ways. bit different, you know, yeah. and Japan's different. So it, I always adjusted to the style. So in ECW, you took it lighter? No, ECW, I, I, you know, I took un, uh, unnecessary risks, where like now, you know, that I'm older, I can take necessary risks. Yeah. In Japan, yeah. it's a little different, you know, yeah. you're hitting harder. Yeah, you in Japan, you're hitting harder, but you don't, um, we were a, a comedy, like we talked about earlier, we did a little more comedy stuff, and hardly ever did we do the hardcore things. Yeah. Even then, it was, the hardcore stuff wasn't like it was in the ECW part. Yeah. yeah, we had like one hardcore match, I think, in ECW. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, kind of more in Kuroda. At, at Corrigan. Yeah. Yeah, and if anybody's ever seen the pictures or whatever, me and Steve holding the tag belts, he's a bloody mess. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, that, was a, that was a rough one, so. So y'all held the tag team ECW belts? Yeah. No, the NWA okay. Intercontinental title. Japanese titles. The Japanese titles. We held those. And that was a, like a huge honor for us to be here. That, you know, Tani and Tanaka had them for a while. Yeah. Um, but that, that was a big thing. Hashimoto and Agawa. Yeah, Hashimoto and Agawa had them and they gave them to me and Steve because when we had our run for like six months as far as there, every six months, I mean, me and Steve were over. And we yeah, were, the, they, they, it was cool because we felt rewarded. You yeah. know, we felt like we earned. Did you keep, yeah. keep the belts? Like when you're on the tour. Yeah. You don't take them home. No, I'm not coming back them? from Japan like no. that, no. Did you keep the ECW World title? No. Justin Incredible told me the same thing. He didn't get, keep his belt. No, I uh, yeah. I lost it on the the last pay per view against Rhino. He took he had it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always thought that y'all kept the belt. Oh, then they made another one for the no, next time. No, no, no. No, they just keep the same belt. Wow. Yeah. I know now I think in the WWE they give them a replica. Oh, they got the money. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. We'll figure it out, you know. But I always thought since back then, you know, I always viewed you as you was on TV, you know, and yeah. you, ex oh, you expect the best, I think, you know. What the hell are you doing? He's texting. Did I do an interview? Dude, I got bitches. <laughs> I got problem and bitches are most of them. <laughs> I've been using that for weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got people doing things, you know, things to see, but fuck. Yeah. I didn't wait. You're like a 12-year-old. I've been yeah. texting the whole time. I know. I'm a texter. I got text problems. <laughs> All right, sir. Sorry <laughs> texter. for... Texter? Yeah, he's a texter. What's your next question? That's the first like time I had that one. Yeah, I heard that one. Like a tart. But anyway. All right, can you speak about the Mary Banner Hills? <laughs> uh, we, the Mary Banner Hills, uh, I think it kind of started with the international incident. And it was myself and Steve... Samoa Joe, Loki, Spanky, Frankie Kazarian. Frankie Kazarian. Us, us guys were notorious over there in Japan because we a lot of times we were on tour together and we were just running rampant. Yeah, just, there was you know you get a little boredom out of you and yeah. stuff like that, and we just kind of and Chuck, Chuck, uh, Chuck Guillotine Legrand, Legrand, Guillotine yeah. Legrand, he was part of it, and it was. Man, we just go do some crazy things. Like one night we're in a hotel, bored off our ass, and whoever it was come up with a great idea. We had a balloon fight um, in the middle of the hotel. We had a water balloon fight. Yeah. <laughs> and we were on the 10th floor. So once we started throwing them at each other, we thought it would be cool to throw them off the roof. Yeah, at people downstairs. Yeah, 10 oh, floors up. Yeah. Then it got to the point where we were scared to come out of our room because... So we hit somebody. Yeah, we hit somebody and then... Um, me and Steve and Loki would hide in a room because people were getting vicious and uh, throwing them at you know beyond what we were normally doing normally, and 
they were getting some of the Japanese guys to come and knock on our doors and saying everything was okay. We'd open the door and they'd be standing around the corner with yeah. bombarders. Yeah. Well, Loki gets pissed and starts putting hot water and soap in his so water league. Hoping to hit somebody in the face. Yeah, he Whoa. was like mad as hell about this. And like, damn, he calm down. But I play with Yeah. yeah. Um, so during this water balloon fight, we'd had to take breaks because we'd hear the elevator and it was the managers or the police or somebody like that uh, looking and they'd come off the elevator and the floors would be soaked water everywhere but they colored be, balloon be, pieces everywhere balloon, but there was nothing to be found and they knew who it was because they always put the, the Americans on the floor by themselves that's what they did so uh, there was this huge festival going on Nagoya. I mean then we were in Nagoya there was probably 20,000 people at this festival so we decided to take a break. All right, we're going to call a break. We're going to call a truce like the Hatfield and McCoys. We're going to call a truce. We're going to go to this festival together. And then we were going to go eat. Remember, that's why we split off into two crews. Yes. Yeah. That was when the truce was made. Yeah, we made the truce. We're going to go get something to eat. So we're all going, and Josh Daniels was on this tour. And we go, and it was like his first tour. So it's it's like you, you get initiated on your first tour. Me, I had to work to Kawa, and he clotheslined me 400 times in the face. Whoa. Um, we well, put the hit out on CM. Well, that was an exaggeration. Okay. About, about three. Uh, <laughs> but and like the CM Punk's first and only tour in Japan, um, he we put the hit out on him, and they beat the brakes off of him. So it was yeah. Josh Daniels' turn. So Paul London too. Yeah, Paul London. We got him good. Um, so we're in the festival. And we're walking around, and there's this huge water fountain. With, with this water coming out of the top of some angel or something, I don't know. 20 foot high. Um, so we're walking around it, and me and Joe and Steve and Keith grabbed Josh Daniels. But we all were in different groups, so we all like met eyes, and we all figured out, like, oh shit, let's get Josh. Yeah, like, we, it was no, like telepathic. So we grabbed Josh, and when we did, it was like a cat going into water. His <laughs> nails come out, and he's on the concrete, and he's not wanting to go. And finally, we dump him in this thing. It's about four feet deep, and he's only about three foot tall. So he goes under. Imagine Chris Benoit. That's that's what yes. Josh Daniels. I love looks like. Josh Daniels, but he goes under, and when he comes up, it's like something out of a movie. He comes out with two like water balloons. Predator. Yeah, it's like a predator. It's like he comes out like the predator out of the water. Whoa. He's got water balloons in his water pocket. balloons that he's had for like a yeah. day. Fucker, we've called truce. We, we've called truce. You're supposed to have these. <laughs> and he throws one at Loki, and Loki matrices out of the way and hits this Japanese guy who had just bought his food. <laughs> he has his food, food in his kid's hand in his other hand. <laughs> and it it oh. everywhere. Oh. And, it oh. and all these people are around, fucking they're going at it. It was like this war you were thinking... What are these people thinking? Yeah, with these Americans, when a water balloon fight, we dump Josh, he comes up throwing water balloons. <laughs> like, casually. We look back at him, like, what the fuck are you doing? When he hits this guy, that, that, was, a, that was a fun night. Oh, we got in trouble by the office lady the next day. Yeah. She's like, next time you arrested. Yeah. yeah, they had to keep us from going to prison that night. So, oh. not, let's, let's talk about that real quick. My Going back to my first tour, because prison, for somehow, with this one, um, my first tour over there, this is when Britney Spears was still popular. So my first tour over there, Britney was in Tokyo touring. He lets me know, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to this, her concert because he's a huge Britney Spears fan, like ridiculous. It was um, it was creepy. Um, with, uh, with them text messages, I don't know what could be creepier. But anyway, he... That's no, creepy. Yeah, that's creepy, but it's good times. Um, he tells me, we're going to go to Britney Spears' concert in Tokyo tonight. And what you're going to do is you're going to stand guard. And I'm gonna fucking rape her. I had it in my mind. He was going. I was gonna to go to, to the place with him while and stood guard and why he was gonna rape Britney Spears. <laughs> Try and get on the stage and like yeah. maybe cause like some problems. <laughs> yeah, he was gonna do something. To Figure get we some were of over that. with the press. We were gonna try and do yeah. something. Wow. And I was going. Nothing ever happened. We never went. But <laughs> it's, it's the same thing that he would actually come up with this and involve me in it. <laughs> what you know without Just trying to justify it. Yes. Yeah, so one night he was. Um, one day we were getting ready to come home, and I can't remember if it was his ex-wife or ex-girlfriend that he was fighting with on the phone. Ex-wife. Yeah, it was your ex-wife. 
And the last words he spoke to her, he's like, you fucking bitch, I hope this plane goes down so I ain't got to never see you again. And throws the phone and busts it. And I'm like, bitch, do you realize I'm on the same plane you are? What do I got to do with this plane going down? She was mean. Yeah, she, oh, she was so mean. But he's always roping me into these things, a plane going down, going to prison. Because his theory about going to prison was, hey, I'm bigger than most Japanese guys. I wouldn't have to be anybody's bitch. So I would be dumb. And I'm like, but I don't want to go to prison. I want to go home. I almost went to prison for killing someone. Yeah, well, that, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But <laughs> so, I was lesson that night. <laughs> right, where are we at? Yeah. What happened when when you when you Kazarian and Loki were watching Steven uh, Hashimoto? One of the big honors you could get, and I don't know why you would call it an honor, was to work with somebody like Hashimoto at, at Corgan Hall. It's a singles match. Too. Corgan Hall is it's like Madison Square Garden. It's a, it's a smaller place. It's like what the ECW arena was, but it's right next to the Tokyo Dome, and it was the place to work. So one night Steve gets to work Hashimoto in this match and we know he's getting the brakes beat off him. That's what it was gonna happen. And he was cool with it. So we were second in him and when you're a second, you walk out and you stand beside the ring and some of you know, like your his little cheering section. Well, this is again the the time of the Mary Band of Hills and earlier that day we're standing, me and Frankie Kazarian and Loki are standing around because it's almost like they got like a roller coaster out there. It's like a amusement park. There's 1,500, I'm not exaggerating, 1,500 women, Japanese women, beautiful, lined up to get these boots, those high boots. boots. And that's the one thing now when I see women wearing boots like that, all I can hear is Loki going, boots, because that's all he would say. Oh, they were gorgeous women There's walking like in this place, too. 1,500 for the lines. We run and get Steve, and we come back, and we see all these women coming in, and we're passing on our hotel cars to certain ones, maybe trying to, you know, get a little play there. Of course, it's never going to happen. So later that night, he's working Hashimoto. We work at six, man. We're out there a second. Hashimoto is <coughs> beating his ass. Fucked me up. Punched so, me in the eye. <laughs> me in the forehead. He's bleeding and we're supposed to be, me and Frank busted and my, be, Busted my eyebrow open. We're supposed to be cheering him on and we ain't really caring about the match. We're looking at the women in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. they could care less about my match. So at one I'm point, getting my ass beat. <laughs> at one point, we have no idea what's going on in the match. At one point, he gets dumped outside and he's over there selling and we're looking at these women. Hashimoto, you see him over there? He walks over to us and basically says, hey, how about going to check on yeah. Steve? Hey, hey, guys, guys, Karina's yeah. over there. Yeah, Karina's over here. Go check on him. And we're like, oh, okay. And we have to run around there and ask him oh. if he's okay. Yeah, you're all right. Yeah, man, you're doing great. Come on, Steve, come on. Get him back in the ring. He gets back in the ring. We go back around and sit down like, damn, you see her right there. You think there's a chance you know, lucky you could get her? Not giving one shit. There were right. so many gorgeous girls that came in yeah. the Oh, it was so beautiful. But yeah, I'm kind of fucked up. We're supposed to be better at supporting him while he's getting his ass cooked. <laughs> I just took a bet once that I would get knocked out too. Yeah, you the night it was Gordo. like yeah, you were working Gerard Gordo and it was like my first my first tour. Everybody was betting the over under was a list of five minutes. Gordo was one of the he was in the first UFC. Yeah, he's he's from uh, Holland and he's famous for pulling out somebody's eye. Yeah, you know, he's literally killed people and we were telling the stories of how Paul and things were done at ECW and he was like, well, why didn't you just kill him? That's yeah. what we do. We put him in a trunk and kill him. In Holland, we would take him and we would, we would kill him and then put him in the trunk. <laughs> We're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> We're like, you can't do that shit in the States. <laughs> like, Why not? We just killed him. No. Yeah, don't pay our money. Well, we got, one guy didn't Two thousand dollars. I go kill him. It's no problem. So we're walking back from the hotel one night, and he's talking about killing somebody. That what he was doing, and because Steve had to work him to the next night, and he's getting fired up about killing this guy he had just killed or something. And Steve looks at him and goes, "I love my son very much." Oh, please don't kill me. Oh. So the next night, he's like kicking the shit out of Steve because he hasn't learned how to pull his punches yet. He's doing some roundhouse kicks, and he was supposed to do a roundhouse kick and miss, and Steve was supposed to bob, and he weaved instead and got caught, he was gone. He was knocked out. They all popped in the locker room. We were in the back because a few guys were going to win that bet. And, of course, Steve gets up. So um, it was it was good when Steve would get in the ring. The, the Japanese guys were all like, uh, what? Your friends are no good. <laughs> yeah, we were scabby. They all excited when you get hit. We were scabby. And it was just maybe we were just sorry. Mm -hmm. Can you 
you speak about working cicada? Oh dear God, Watura Sakata was a rings fighter, which yeah, he was tough. Which led into pride to the UFC. He was a tough guy. He was making the transition to pro wrestling, and they were trying to teach him, but he was still learning. Which means again, he wasn't pulling any of his punches or any of his. Kicks. And he had an attitude too. Yeah, he had a yeah, bad he was like attitude. A yeah, he didn't like any Americans or anything like that. And when he walked in, it was like he kayfabed it. He spoke English, but he kayfabed it. I mean, he didn't tell. He didn't let us own that he could speak any English. So, and he was the pretty boy dating the, the gorgeous the model. model. Yeah, I hit and, on her. And um, of course, yeah, he hit on her one night and give out his shoot phone number, and the camera caught it and broadcast it all over the TV. Yeah, gives out his shoot phone number from home. Yeah, on the, in a magazine, you see my sh my mobile phone number. Yeah, so. I'm the first guy to have to work Sakata in a match. They, the music plays, and Spanky and Steve are my seconds. And they come out, and again, they're supposed to be supportive, and Sakata comes out and starts beating my ass. And I can't get away from him, slapping me, kicking me. And every time he slaps and kicks, these two are laughing. And I hear slow oh. key in the back popping. Every time he kicks me, you can hear Key say something, laughing, because he's going to my ass. So kind of thought it was like shoot. He was just like trying to get him in the corner and slap yeah. and kick. And I'm trying to get away from him. We're trying to work the match out with our spots, and he's like trying to shoot on me. I didn't know nothing about the run that time about shoot fighting, and he's beating my ass. And I'm every time I'm getting, he, he hits me one time, and I go down, and I look at Steve, and Steve's like, he's got this look on, it and Spanky's laughing because I'm getting my ass handed oh. to me by this guy. <laughs> little by little. He caught on and like become one of the coolest guys to be in the ring. And a real good worker yeah, too. Yeah, a really good worker. Sakata was really good. And I remember him sitting. We were me and Steve were in the gym at, at the dojo. Mm -hmm. Sakata walks in. He looks over at us. And he goes, "Really?" In his English, because he, me and Steve, were not known for being workout enthusiasts. And he comes up to me. He says, "Remember our first time we wrestled?" And I really didn't know much. And I really took advantage of you. I went. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah, he's like, now I'm such a good, now I know so much more. I wish I'd have never done that. I'm like me too. Uh, he was cool. Yeah, he, got, he was really cool. Girl was gorgeous. Though. Gorgeous. He just got divorced too. Really? There's your chance. Yeah, I'm thinking about put, how to put this uh, the famous Uno game, I would say, I guess. Oh, dear God. <laughs> yeah. It was like eight days long. Man. Yeah, it was an eight day. Where is me and Frankie and Steve and Loki? Somehow, around this time, uh, Sylvester Turkey, we called him Bear, he was a f real popular wrestler from NC State, around from where I'm from, was on his laptop computer playing his little Dungeons and Dragons game. Or yeah, because as big as he was, he was the biggest nerd in the yeah, entire world. Yeah, he was. He was a huge mm -hmm. nerd. So we break some, Steve brings Uno cards and just must, somehow breaks them out. Well, we got addicted to playing Uno. And at nights, we'd go to the little convenience store. Everybody else was going out partying and drinking, and we would go to the convenience store and get food and come back and sit around their conference tables playing Uno and eating food and watching Blazing Saddles. Like all night. All night. Like same thing for eight days. We did it on the, on the bullet train. We spun the seats around, put Steve's Halliburton in the middle, and played Uno. We played a hundred hands of Uno in eight days. We were cutting each other down, going racist jokes. Oh, you know, yeah. it was <laughs> bad. And, you know, we were talking about Loki being bad. Black, <laughs> black and fraying. You know, my it just it was got. It, it was got, so, well, yeah. Anybody that would walk in the locker room was free game for our frustrations. Yeah, yeah for, and you know, there was a fifty-three-year-old man that wrestled with us, and instead of, he's out trying to get women and. We're sitting here playing Uno like two nerds. Thank you, Chad. Why? Why? You guys are uh, young guys. Go. Yeah. We're yeah, like, no, no, gotta no. win this game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so every night it was the same thing. We were playing Uno, watched Blazing Saddles, and ate ham and crackers. Yeah. And cut each other down. Best times of our life. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Can you speak about your first tour, Hashimoto Fujiwara? Yeah, that, that was what we talked about earlier with, you know, working those guys with the, okay. you know, them being like the Rock and the Hogan. What's the head measurement? Oh, dear God. They're, I was under a lot of pressure. Every, the whole thing, I've had the same head size since I was 12 years old. 
I have a big head. And in ECW, that's all. I've been real my entire life about having a big head. Um, we get hooked up with an agent to try and do commercials and stuff like that. So he's taking measurements of us. It's, a, it's this, this black guy, this African guy. And I'm not saying African, just I mean, brother, but he just come off. Yeah, he, he, had, exactly. he had a line in his back pocket, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> he, that's, what he, that's what he was. Um, he was measuring us, and he measures my head, and I'm like, okay, it's pretty big, blah, blah, blah. He measures Steve's head, and his head's bigger. One millimeter. One millimeter bigger. I'm so mad. Still bigger. So, yeah, his head was kidding. bigger than mine. Right? It wouldn't look like it. But <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. You kidding me? Yeah, it was. I had a headache that time. One millimeter, <laughs> a thousand millimeters. It's still bigger. Whoa. So I went home, or I went to the internet cafe, <laughs> put it all over instant because that time it was still instant messages and AOL. I was, you know, put it all over that. Was telling everybody back. I was telling everybody. Steve's head was bigger. <laughs> writing emails, shit like that. His head's bigger. Bitches, leave me alone. That's what it was about. The whole time he was mad because he had a lot on his mind. You know, it stuff, it was, it, he had a headache. It was the hair, shit. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, my hair was long. Yeah, he had a, it was every excuse in the book. His scars made his head bigger, or whatever. But your head was bigger. So for for like a few, how long was your? Head? Oh, it was a couple months. Yeah, a couple months. Yeah, I called my girl at home and was telling her about it, and she was called. She called his sister and was telling him about it. Yeah, it was it was good times for me. I didn't feel you know so pressured then. Once we did the resizing, I was much smaller. Yeah, still, I think it was gimmick, but it's okay. <laughs> Is it true Carino spooned the Japanese man on flight? Oh dear God, that was the glass. We, the flight's home from Japan, 13, 14 hours. I can never sleep, never. He could be, he could sleep 12, 15 hours a night before and still sleep the entire flight home. Oh, I could sleep on a roller coaster. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> known for that. So one one tour on the way back, I, I finally get to sleep. We sleep the entire ride. I wake up as we're taxiing, as we're coming in. He is in the middle seat, the bench seat. I'm against the window, that's how it always was. And it was a little Japanese guy over here. So when I come up, I was laying back and I come up, oh, I woke up and I looked, something didn't look right. This motherfucker was turned <laughs> like this, this leg over the Japanese guy. He was over him like this, holding the guy like And the Japanese guy's <laughs> He was, the Japanese guy didn't move. He was looking like this. Me. No, no, not at all. So I bumped him like this. Steve wakes up. He looks at Jeffrey. Got he turns to me and goes, "How oh, fucking long have I been spooning with this guy?" <laughs> so I go, "Dude, I don't know, but I think you might want to get his number." <laughs> the whole, however long it was, that Japanese guy did not move. Peed myself on a flight too. <laughs> yeah, that's too, too many Taliban. Yeah. <laughs> too many Taliban PMs. Yep. <laughs> Uh, wow. Yeah, if you ever have a dream about peeing, yeah. get up and pee. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work for me. <laughs> oh, man, okay. This this sounds interesting to me right here. Talk about the horsemen team, team and the horsemen team in Japan. I, I love tagging with Steve in Japan. Um, Who do they consist of, first of all? It was just us. In Japan, in, in Japan, it was okay. just us two. We were the, we were the horsemen. Um, over here, we we're really serious, really badass guys. Over there, we're a little more common. It's like we spoke about earlier. We're the, as you said, the nice guys outside the ring. Um, but we would get the job done. And everywhere we went, we were over. A lot of times, the Yakuza was sponsoring our shows, and they would take their favorite wrestlers out. A lot of times it was me and Steve because we entertained the fans. You know, the guys, not so much the fans, we entertained the, the Yakuza. When we're doing stuff and look over and the Yakuza are laughing and joking, we're doing something. And we would even tell them, you shut your mouth. Yeah, and they'd be like, ah. Yeah, they'd laugh. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. would tell us, be like, oh, please, don't talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, nah, they're entertained. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were instructed not to go near them, not to speak to them. So, yeah. so one night, they said, uh, our boss comes up and says, look, they want to take you out. Who? The Yakuza. Okay. So they take us out and put me and Steve in this taxi. And we start heading, going, going down the road. And the taxi has one of their guys in it. You know, he's one of their enforcers. And we go off the main road. 
and start going on this little single highway. There's trees on both sides, and it starts getting serious because I'm not seeing anything. I'm like, I look up still, I said, Steve, they're going to fucking kill us. They're going to take, they're taking us somewhere and kill us. <laughs> and what, we started, started panicking a little bit. Because for like 10, 15 minutes, you couldn't see nothing but trees and road. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it just, out of, in the middle of nowhere. Like, out, out of nowhere, it opens, and it's like this, the best I can describe it, like a Texas roadhouse steakhouse. Just in the middle of nowhere, by itself. And we come in, and there's a couple other the Yakuza already there. And there's the girls, they're in cowgirl outfits with the cowboy hat and the skirt serving us and things like that. Whole cowboy theme. But we're sitting there and they're talking about how big fans there are for us and they're buying us drinks and things like that. Right. Um, and unless like our boss would take us, me and Steve out one night, he would only do it with us. He'd take us to Hostess Bars. The Hostess Bars is, we were just, um, it was all women. And you got me and him and the boss and him buying drinks and beautiful Japanese women sitting around. Filling your drink or anything you needed, like if you're if you're a smoker, yeah, yeah, lighting your cigarette, listening to your conversation, just there to put you over more. Yeah, yeah. when we're gonna put you over, just make you feel better about yourself. Being that that seems y'all did so good over there, mm -hmm. why why didn't you um, make a career over there? Uh, because uh, the way they run tours, you can only work like 26 weeks a year, and plus uh, near the end when the Hashimoto was having his problems and ended up passing away, and then with the economy company just literally oh, okay. they could have done the yeah. yeah especially with the hotels and things like that we were really cost effective over there yeah. you was talking about that earlier with me can you um speak about that a little bit about the um like how it's some sort of in these organizations going on over there it's like so similar to well it here. used to be um when i started no one and when cw started no two there was the four major companies, which is Zero One, which is our company, uh, NOAA, Pro Wrestling NOAA, All Japan Pro Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Now, because of the economy and the, you know, how to keep costs down, guys aren't under contract as much, now you see like little indies popping up like it was the States, and the, there's something like 70 to 75 like little independent organizations right in just Tokyo. So it's, it's crazy to see how watered down it, it does get. Is it, yeah. You know, it's just like being in the States and in the market. Cor Corgan Hall would run uh, shows seven days a week, 12, 3, and 6. Yeah. 12 p.m. On a Sunday, I've, we've worked at Corgan Hall on a Sunday at 12 p.m. Yeah, right at noon. Right it's at amazing. Noon. You were saying earlier that all Japan and New Japan still exists, right? Yep. Yeah. So how big are they now? They're doing, New Japan's the highest, you know, but uh, all Japan's doing all right. Noah's, the, we're, we're back on our way up. And there, there really hasn't been uh, another company to just like come in and, and take over. Like Dragon mm -hmm. Gate's really good. They they have like a niche crowd. Yeah. Um, DDT's doing well, but they have like their niche crowd. They're not like a full time company. So what kind of crowds they be making over? Uh, it all depends where they they go. You know, now they have so many different crowds. Like a big Japan crowd is a hardcore crowd. They wouldn't go to a zero one show, and zero one fans wouldn't go to an all Japan show. So. You know, you're really splitting up your audience a little That's bit. Weird. But I would think a fan's a fan. Yeah, so there's the more seating. What's the seating? Different. Huh? In the arenas, what's the seating? I can't be anywhere from like 400 to you know oh, really? 3,000. Really? Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> can you speak about Loki and the spider? <laughs> um. What? Oops. Yeah. The um. Custom over there is they would take us out a lot. Not just you know the, the bar, but the boss would take the whole crew out to some restaurant or some place and eat. Well, when you go over there and you eat, you eat what they prepare for you. And when they mm -hmm. serve it, you have to eat it. It's custom. It's yeah. disrespect. You know, it's just what they say. So one night we're sitting um, at this restaurant. And we're sitting on these little on these pillars, and they had this huge boiling oil and we're cooking shrimp we're cooking all kinds of stuff mind you beforehand we had gotten blazed up just to be able to eat this food because some of it was i mean when you're eating octopus and it's sticking on the going on the way down it's kind of hard to get down and it was crazy because uh the girl i was dating at the time had like a her uh weed pipe and for some reason she put it in my jacket pocket which oh, i didn't yeah. know and I put my jacket pocket in my I put my jacket in my bag. So I'm opening up my bag to go like to put my one jacket on and go to dinner. I'm like, 
what's this metal thing? I'm like, oh my god, like how did I? He comes in the country. Yeah, he comes through customs with that in his thing. And we're, we're sitting there watching the Japanese men abuse the young boys over there. I mean, they they were they were like pissing in their beers, making them drink. And oh. taking, one of them was walking around. One of the young boys was walking around naked. And the young boy is somebody that's just started. Trainee. Um, trainee. They, he walked around naked and they took chopsticks and stuck them in the head of his dick and was putting money in the chopsticks. Oh, yeah. Beer. It was wild. Yeah. The things they do to these guys, I've seen them pick them up and throw them off the end of a pier over there. This is crazy stuff. So we're in there and we're getting enjoyment out of it because we're out of our freaking mind. <laughs> and this Whoa. fucking tarantula comes out of yeah. a corner out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. And I, when I say tarantula, he's probably this freaking big and I'm not exaggerating. This fucking spider was the biggest thing I've ever seen. Low key, this guy is scared of things like that. <laughs> Petrified of little critters, little especially big critters. And this thing comes out, and then me and Steve are sitting here. Low key, said so we're sitting up against the walls. Key sitting here, and this spider comes out. He goes right behind Low key as to almost stop and look at him and go, "Sup." Yeah. And he keeps right on walking, and Key looks at him and goes, <laughs> "Look at that little spider right there." And this yeah. fucking spider was this big. Whoa. People are moving out of the way, but we were so fucked up we couldn't remember. We're like, "Yeah, hey, look at that little spider, man." Key, look at that little spider right there. Thing was huge. <laughs> Wow. Can you um speak a little bit about Loki? Um, I don't know what are, what are your thoughts on him. They say he take the business serious. He's supposed to. Um, a little Listen. too serious, to put it that way. Um, and, and I don't know. I think he broke his neck over there, right? No, he broke his jaw. Jaw. Oh, uh, a couple times, didn't he? He, Twice. he never yeah. broke his neck. Nah. No. No, not key. Okay. Love me and Steve love Loki. He's yeah. and he's one of these. If you don't know him, you're not gonna like him because he comes off hard. Because yeah. he loves this business now. He takes his training, he takes his business seriously. Sure does. Yeah. Some don't like it. Some think it's too serious. Because I, I never met him. I just you know I, I ask questions that you hear on the internet. Yeah, you know, it. You know, um, I had I knew Key. I did a tour with him in uh, <coughs> Trinidad and Tobago in South America, and then got really got to know him. In, J in Japan, and uh, not too long ago, he came to my house in North Carolina on his way up and spent time with me and my family, which, you know, I love the guy for doing that, taking time out. He literally outrun a hurricane and come and spend time with me. And as the hurricane was catching up, left and outrun it again. And took back off, went and visited Sanjay Dutt. <laughs> um, very athletic, very talented. And he's, so talented. So talented, and he's one of these the reason I don't think he's gotten far in this business he's gotten his breaks with WWE but he don't take no crap no. You, you shit on him he's gonna let you know he's not gonna sit there and bite it like some of the people do he's gonna let you know and you gotta respect the guy that stands up for himself like that he'd rather be doing Indies and stuff like that and you know have his morals than to you know, uh, sit there and just you know keep his mouth shut would you agree I totally agree I mean that guy's like a throwback to the, the time when the boys had the control and the promoters didn't. Yeah. He believes that the, the boys should have control of their lives. And, man, cool. he, he takes 100% serious, but he's a, he's a good dude. Cool. You know, I just like getting those type of things out there because, you know, you hear things on the Internet. I guess sometimes people get a bad rap and you get that other side that people don't know. Yeah, like, he doesn't deserve it. He's, he's no, all 100% professional. Yeah, they took it. If everybody took it as serious as he did, and was in the shape that guy's in with the talent, his business would be a lot better off. I agree. No doubt. What do you think about, um, did you watch when he was came to WWE? And the mm -hmm. tough yeah, I watched some Yeah, I loved it. You know, yeah. even them throwing him with the girls, he made it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he, yeah. he's smart. He's a, he's a lot smarter than people give him credit for. The only thing I didn't like was the outfit. Yeah, the sure name kind of went with him, but the outfit yeah. was yeah, sure that was his choice. Thing, yeah. yeah, I like him. He's good, man. He's good for the business, I think. <clears throat> All right, CW, I hear you're very competitive playing baseball. <coughs> oh, yeah, we went over that story. Can you Korean speak a little bit about playing against him, Karina? I uh, can't play against him. Can you give me one take... second? Yeah. All right, we're going to um, come back to that in part four. All right. All right? Okay, favor with Steve Karina on CW. All right, we're back on OKFavorite.com, part four, CW, and Steve Carino. All right, 
We're going to start off where we left off. My competitiveness. Your competitiveness. Yeah, right? Carino, can you elaborate? This guy's the easiest guy to get along with, except for like if you play baseball with him or go bowling with him. Any like legitimate sport that you play against this guy, he's your worst enemy. Uh, but yeah, you put him in a professional wrestling atmosphere, he'll do whatever you want. Uh, yeah, we talked about the incident that he had with the, the little leaguers that almost got us kicked out of the country. We, we would take back in practice and see how far I could hit it. And, uh, when he and I would throw, like, like I said, we always took our gloves and stuff to Japan, and I would see how hard I could throw until he said, okay, I've had enough to hurt his hand. Yeah. He doesn't throw so hard. It was, it was always funny to throw it and watch him just get the hell out of the way and say, you know what, fuck this. I'm not playing with you anymore. Yeah, I couldn't, yeah. He was the bully. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. it didn't make it fun. Um, yeah. uh, Sounds yeah. like two kids playing. But like you're you're like competitive in wrestling too sometimes. Yes, yeah, I try to I try to have try to have the best match. Try to I'll, I'll do here and there, but um, you always want to be remembered. Yeah, always got to be remembered. I think that's where the general came in. Don't you think? Or the time Mike Austin didn't know who you were. Fuck Mike Austin. <laughs> he resting in peace. Huh? Everybody knows who Mike Austin is. Yeah, he was our ECW World Heavyweight Champ. He was a big fucking goof. Um, Ooh, what, yeah, because yeah, I've wrestled this guy 10, 15 times, and every time I wrestled him ECW, I was thinking, you know, this guy's our ECW World Heavyweight Champ, and I'm calling the match. You know, I'm the guy calling the match, and I'm I'm new. Yeah. So one night we're in Rapongi. Again, Rapongi is Manhattan, Times Square in Tokyo, but it's only cleaner. Yeah. Yeah, it's really clean and more people. Crazy. It's me and Key. Steve Spanky. And Spanky, we're walking down George, with George and Big George. We're going to a bar. We see Mike Awesome out of nowhere. Come up, sunglasses on. Sunglasses on. It's <laughs> like freaking eleven o'clock at night, and this idiot's got sunglasses on. Biggest <laughs> smile on his face. Because he's, he's blazed out of his mind, and we're all drunk. And he he goes, "Hey man, what's going on? Hey Carino, buddy, how you been, man? It's Spanky, what's going on, dude? Uh, low key, man, I ain't seen you in forever. George, God, man, I ain't seen you. He gives me, he goes." Hey, man. <laughs> Steve leans over Mary and goes, he don't know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, he wrestled me, so like, wrestle me like 30 sometimes, and he didn't know who the hell yeah, I was. Kidding. Didn't have a clue. So the rest of the tour, <laughs> I was on his big ass. Oh. He had, so he went on my list. What and you all, mean it was all? You know, about, I was always ribbing him, always something about him not remembering who I was. Because once Steve goes, it's CW, man. Yeah, man, I don't know who the fuck I was. He didn't know who I was. Yeah, <laughs> he had shit. never met Loki in his <laughs> he life. He had never he's met like, Loki. What, he's like, I'm, dude, I've heard so much about <laughs> you. Yeah. yeah, but he's known me and wrestled me 15, 20 times, and you can't remember who the hell I was. And see, we have wow. a thing called, a, in wrestling, at least Steve and I, the Mary Band of Heels, have a thing called a list. How the hell? If, if you piss us off or if you do something that's really, that dad is down there, you go on our list. Yeah. And then it's, a, it's long but distinguished. Yeah. And the only way you can get off that list, if you die, Mike Olsen was on my list. Wow. Yeah, he, that was a big win for him. Yeah, I, I won for that when he died, when he killed hey, himself. rest in peace. Yeah, yeah but CW <laughs> calls me and goes, did you hear about wow. Mike Olsen? And I said, no, man, what happened? He goes, fucking killed himself. He's off the list. I go, yeah. I go, how? He goes, you go, hanging. And then it's silence. You go, can't believe the motherfucker didn't fuck that up. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. I'm kind of a mean streak. Sometimes. Oh, it was, huh? I have a mean streak. Yeah. Stuff right now. Somebody, when you have somebody on your list and they die, oh, it's the greatest thing in the entire yeah, world. Because you've won. You've won then. Oh. Yeah, you normally don't win. It's like picking a celebrity to die. Yeah. If somebody does that. Ah, uh, fuck you, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> yeah, when Keanu dies, that's his greatest win. Because when we were at ECW, Steve was dating this chick. Keanu? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that yeah fuck that guy. Okay, yeah. What's this about? Okay, <laughs> we'll go back to ECW real quick. We're in California at a pay-per-view. And uh, then I'll tell you the truth. Steve was dating this chick that knew Keanu. They met him at a party. He comes up and this Keanu acts like, okay, you know who the hell I am, I'm Keanu Reeves. Of course Steve knows who he is, but he doesn't put it over. Yeah, but he was pretty adamant to tell me that he's Keanu Reeves. <laughs> he's like, don't you, know my, no, don't you know who I am? Yeah, Steve's like, 
no, I have no clue. No, but, you know, but, yeah. Because she, she, she goes, hey, Keanu, this is my uh, boyfriend, Steve, you know, the one, the wrestler. And he kind of, I don't know, what did he say about being a wrestler? What was that? He's like, like, what's this wrestling all about? Uh, like, uh, he's just down. Uh, but it's like people yeah, are always yeah, 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 that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, no, what really? And he looked at me, he's like, uh, like, he looked at me as like, hey, that's my girl, by the way. <laughs> and I like, I was smart enough to know that she probably put him over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so but, gorgeous, way out of his league. I uh, never got her. I don't know. Yeah, but it got heated, man. Like it got like I, I stood up, he was up, yeah, and they were putting it out. These guys will tell you that I got pumped out, but I don't believe <laughs> yeah, it. That's a better believe, story. Yeah, I don't believe it. It's a better story. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't care if they and then I, I got in trouble by Paul Heyman for not hitting him. And I said, well, I would have went to jail. He's like, Kitty. my father's a lawyer. I, I would have got you right out. He's like, that would have been great publicity for ECW. Wow. Like, oh, what yeah. a story. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Right, I'm back in Japan, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> Mike That's Austin, was, he was a trip. Yeah, he was. Yeah, man, speak about him a little bit. I don't know. Sounds like he got some He was us. dopey. Very, very dopey. Be as big as he was, he was he was very dopey. Him and Tanaka had some great matches. They beat the crap out of each other. Yeah, but yeah, I think it's yeah. like brutal. That's yeah, but I, I think Tanaka throw. was pretty happy. I wanted to speak on those matches. I seen him throw Tanaka over the yeah, top rope to the outside. Could, I seen those matches. Tanaka was scared of that. I got a lot of. He could like, stand it. Even though I never, like I said, I didn't follow y'all back then. Now I collect all that. So I have all that. I have all that. Yeah, Tanaka couldn't yeah. stand working with him. Yeah, I hated it. Yeah, as much as they had great matches, he couldn't stand it because Mike Austin wouldn't protect you. Yeah, he just dropped him on his yeah, head. Yeah, when he, he German. How can you protect him throwing him from. You can't. From over the top rope to the outside it's to the concrete. So much, not so yeah. much that. It was but, concrete. But if if, he's, if you're doing it a certain way, you can protect you know, the power bombs in the ring, the German suplexes in the ring. You can yeah, protect guys the ring, yeah. But he never did. Guys like me or yeah, anybody, yeah, yeah. Mike never protected. He just used his strength and would dump you. You land how you wanted to. Yeah. He had retard strength. Yeah, literally. I seen one time he um in WCW they had that he, he, he dropped somebody off the off a bus or something. But he actually tried to grab the guy, man. Like, he seen him slipping. Because yeah. when he did something, I think he knocked him out. He knocked the guy out. And he slipped off. It, it was on top of a bus. Cause it was like a, yeah, that's when he was doing that you know, crazy guy match over there at WCW. Yeah. And, and the guy literally was knocked out, slid off the top of the bus. And he went to grab him, man. He went to help him, you know. Right. So, you know, it was like, I don't know. Never know, you know. Sometimes maybe he just didn't even know what he was doing. You know? <laughs> you yeah, know? That's bad. That's bad being in the ring yeah. with him, with yeah. somebody not knowing what you're doing. Uh, can you speak about Tom, Tom and Bear not believing in the Horsemen and what's the match that never was? Uh, Tom Howard and Sylvester Turkey, we talked about it earlier. They were the top guys in Japan for zero one. Steve and I were gaining respect from Hashimoto as being the workers that we were like the best American workers there was. Anytime they wanted to teach an American style, they'd get the young boys to go learn with Steve and CW. They wouldn't send them to Tom and Bear. Now Tom and Bear come from UBW, the same group John Cena did, which that group was, I always thought they were better than anybody else. So when it come time for things, for angles and stuff like that, more than likely they'd always go to Steve with with stuff and they Tom and Bear couldn't stand it. Uh, one night we had to wrestle with these guys. I don't know where were we at. Uh, Gifu, yeah. Hashimoto's hometown. And like from like twenty thousand yeah. people, and we worked these guys. And the match was the match was so bad. Oh. Because one, they messed everything up. They didn't want to listen to what we said. We kept telling oh. them, if you do it our way, you'll get over. And the match would be great. And half the work. And right. half the work. You didn't have to do all the work you did. They, these oh, guys had to understand. So we're not there to take your spot. You guys are the two top guys. And we're here to help support you. Yeah, we're the supporting players. Yeah. And they didn't want to bleed us. They didn't go out and did the match. They wanted to do and The match was ridiculous. Oh, so bad. So when the DVD came out and they showed it on TV, our match never got yeah, shown. Yeah. Even was, in the report. It was smelly shit. It even was in so the bad. report on the Japanese websites, the paper, the newspaper and stuff like that. Yeah. Our match wasn't listed. So it's like the match never happened. The crowd saw it. 
but as far as the rest of the world, they don't want to admit it. Yeah, that match was bad. Yeah. And who were these guys? Like they was like what? Is high standard. Well, that's that's what I said. They come from UPW in California. That was one of the top organizations, Rick Baxman's organizations, and they, and they all, were developmental for a while, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, for WWE, they yeah. were WWE developmental deal. So they were always bred that they were better than everybody oh, else. Okay, and right. once Steve and uh, and I, you know, we didn't we we had it out with him in the locker room after that. Oh. It, it was bad, and oh, you know, Barry could have killed us because Barry was like a legit. Yeah, shoot, like, he, he he's was a big dude. Tough. Tough luck. But we had to make them understand, you know, like I said, we're not here to take your spot. We're here to support. Mm -hmm. If you listen to us, we'll get you over because yeah. we know what the hell we're doing. And then after that, they started listening. And even Bear has said many times, he said at WWE, Steve and CW are two of the best minds in wrestling. You just got to listen to them. Yeah, yeah it was it was intense for a while because, the, you know, we never we, knew if we were going to fight them yeah, any night. There was the many room. tours we didn't speak. Yeah. And we all four. Then it was at the point we were the four top guys in there, and we didn't speak to each other in the locker room. And everybody was like, "Okay, there's a lot of intensity going on with these four. And we never fucked them. Yeah, we didn't care who they were. They didn't care who we were. We yeah. knew we could outwork them. Yeah. Me and still, you know, me and Steve know that we can outwork a lot of people with our skill. But um, we didn't care. You come from you know, it's a big deal. We don't care. But. We become good friends out there once they realize and calm down. Then it got cool. Yeah, that yeah. was. Yeah, they would. We would sit and talk. Everything yeah. we talk about. We all apologized. And, you know, had the big man hug. And yeah, all good after that. Los Hashimoto, can you speak on that? That's you. That was bad. Um, you know, we had worked for Hashimoto for so long, and you know, he he was such a cool guy. I was uh, coming through immigration on uh, July 10th, 2005. Come through, they zip my passport, they're like, oh, wait, Chris, you are a zero one wrestler. I'm like, oh yeah, I am. They're like, oh, please come with me. So they take you in this room and you're like, you don't know if you're in trouble or something like that. So they come in there like, uh, uh, your boss, Hashimoto? I'm like, yeah, yeah, uh, he's dead. I'm like, what? you like, a movie I'm like what they're like uh, and they wheel this TV and they're like and it was like right on the news like Hashimoto dead I'm like holy shit and um, over here it'd be the equivalent of Hogan dying yeah really Hogan just di dropping dead yeah I don't know I gotta oh, look that up. yeah, look yeah and it, it was just like a crazy time because we had heard so many rumors of like him owing money to the mafia, or you know, was he really sick or stuff like that? And, How did and, he die? Uh, I don't know. Uh, no. It's shady. Where did I, it's it shady. I think he was killed. We Where? both think he was killed, but we can't confirm or not. Yeah. So. Where did they find the body supposedly? Uh, at his girlfriend's apartment. Uh, there's rumors of how he got killed, and but you just never know for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. We like to remember that, you know, it, it, it didn't happen that way. So, it was um, it was a loss because Hashimoto got to where he trusted me and Steve for a while where he would let me and Steve, because Japanese customs, when you when you come over wrestling, you don't call the match, they call it for you. They lay it out for you, and you just go with it. And it got to the point where Steve and I were over with them, and they we'd go in and work Hashimoto. We work Hashimoto, for like, felt like a thousand times. Oh, yeah. And he got to a point where he's like, y'all call the match. I don't care. You do it because it's going to be good either way. And it was an honor for us. We yeah, he'd ask like, us for ideas. Yeah, ideas, anything. And, you know, you send the young boys to us to train with them, um, you know, for us to train them because he wanted them trained the right way in the American style. And that was such a huge honor coming from Hashimoto. And when, when he died, uh, that, was a, that was a big loss because after that, man, zero one one went down because we didn't have that superstar anymore. Yeah, it just came crumbling down. <laughs> yeah. Was Zero Going. One any different? Like what it was? Zero One was, we were called Fighting Athletes. It was a strong style company, which it was pro wrestling. And I've always compared it as it was pro wrestling and mixed martial arts combined. Over here where it's mostly entertainment, over there when they're kicking and punching and slapping you, or they're bringing it. It was a Man. wake up call. The clotheslines, everything is hard. It was nothing for Steve and I to have 20, 30 bruises on us by the time we left. Oh. And if one of us won't hurt, 
there was something wrong from yeah. every tour. Steve, you've done how many tours over there? 79. I've done 48. And mm. every time we go, first time I went over there, I had my head set off the access joint. It's almost like the almost equivalent of getting it broke. Mm. And, you know, he's broke his neck over there. He broke his hand numerous times. He broke his hand one night, and we flew home to our homes and turned around and eight hours later and flew to Australia, Australia. and wrestled each other. And yeah. With a broken hand. Oh, man. So, so I didn't have this question on my own. On my question thing, but it just brings me to something that I'm kind of trying to prove, and one thing I'm trying to, you know, teach with my site is, um, you know, the realistic part of wrestling. You know, and you know there is a realistic side of everything in life, believe it or not. And wrestling, they do have a realistic side to it, and it's funny. I know you hear it much. You must hear it a lot. Wrestling's fake. Yeah. You know, um, this proves to some people that you know that watch gonna watch my show that believe that would probably make a stupid comment like that, and, and when they hear y'all saying it for yourselves, they'll understand yeah. a little better maybe. You know, so I'm glad y'all threw that in there. The realistic. Oh yeah, right, they hit you we, hard. And we they had hit you real. today. Had us. One, you know? one, one thing we so we're telling on this shoot interview, we got no reason to lie. Everything we're telling is, is the truth and will be the truth. Jamie Dundee, who was a member of PG thirteen, Bill Dundee's son, says it best: wrestling's not fake; it's fixed. The outcome we know. It's, it's predetermined. We know who's going to win. Yeah. But the point how we get there, as like Roddy Popper said, is that's the magic, and it's not fake. We get hurt. The things we in there we do, we get real. People see the glamour side. They see the, you know you being this celebrity, this rock star. They don't see you wrestling, you know, at a high level that most athletes can't do, and then get in the car, drive three or four hours, only to turn around to get up the next day, be up by six o'clock in a gym in a tanning bed to be at the building by a certain time to do it all over again. You wrestle like that five days a week, and you do it. We have we're not like professional baseball players or football players. We don't have an off season. <laughs> We're constantly doing this. I mean, how long can you do this before your body says, all right, I've had enough. It's yeah. time for me to break down. That's why some of your wrestlers are dead under the age of 40 because they're having to take things to keep their body and their persona at a level that the fans see. You see the great side, but you don't see the other side. This business is a wear and tear, and it's like the ocean. It don't care. You'll drown in the ocean. It don't care. The same thing with wrestling. It'll chew you up, spit you out. There's another guy there to take your place. This guy's more banged up than anybody I know and still goes out there and mm. does it night in and night out. Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, he, he goes. You know, I always said I'm the workhorse of the team, but he's right, he's right there with me. Um, when we're hurt, we still have to perform. And to call it fake is an insult to our, mm -hmm. to our integrity. You, yes. Most people can't do it. The ones that call it fake are the ones that just sit there and look for an easy way out because they're the ones that can't do it. Or don't want to. Yeah, that's as clear as I think I could have ever got it on my site, and I so appreciate the way y'all put it. Cause uh, if you don't understand that, then I don't think you have any common sense. To be honest. All right, back to um, where we were. Um, working with him and letting him call the matches. Yeah, that's what we talked about earlier. Him letting us call everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, working the Beatles. No, it's, tra oh. it's traveling with the Beatles. Oh. Traveling with the Beatles. Well, it's okay, pretty much what was go. it like. And this is for him to answer because this is about Man. It's just like tra traveling with the Beatles. You know you know how, like, um, you know, you'll have a friend that, like, brags, right? And you're like, oh, it's bullshit, it's bullshit, it's bullshit. <laughs> well, although we didn't want to admit it, for, like, six months, CW would go to Cork and Holland in Tokyo and he would just get over more and more and more, and he would always come back. He's like, I'm "Fucking over, right?" And we're like, "No, you're not. No, you're not." We all were like, "He's fucking over," and it got to the point where he would walk into the building. I don't know what it was, but there was this group of girls, and they were like, "Ah, see that I'm like, "Holy Justin fucking Bieber!" It's, you know, they just like flock to him, and he looks. He goes, 
Just like the Beatles, over like the Beatles. <laughs> we, we walk over over the arena one night, and Steve and Charlie are standing here, and I walk, and these three girls come out, and they're just like that, just like they're meeting Justin Bieber or whoever whoever it was, and crying and shaking. Ah, uh, it was sickening to meet me and to get my autograph uh, and picture. And yeah, we would never live it down. Never, and it's it's, and he can verify it. I never I never. Really, brag to joke about it but it's like every country every place we go to I would always end up finding one one lady oh I, I had to drag him back off the, on the, the plane in Australia the first time we went he was gonna move there over this move there fuck it I won't come at home yeah we, we let we get over there and which once we get into Australia we get over there and me and this girl she sits down one night at a restaurant and we lock as long as we oh. lock eyes and it was like a connection. It was we over. spent three days together. And when we go back to the airport, we get out because we're coming home. And it's time for us to go home. I give him a hug. Later, man. Love you. Said, what the hell are you yeah, doing? Are you coming back with me? I said, fuck that. I'm yeah. staying. He said, dude, you got to come home. And yeah. Hell you got to go. <laughs> so he ends up talking me into it. But, yeah, it's like that. It's like that everywhere. I don't know what it is. I think I got a great smell. It's your eyes. It's the yeah, eyes. It's the eyes. That's what it is. We well, must think it's the eyes. I saw you when I seen the picture. You, you just look so clean. They saw it all. <laughs> oh, and little do they know he's the devil. <laughs> but it's good, though. I don't know. Yeah, it's, you've been there. Right, I've this seen is for you, um, Carino. What? It's for you, this question. Um, I wanted to ask you, how's ROH compared to the ECW? Um, it's a little different because I think it like the stage of my career. You know, when I, when I was in ECW, I was young, um, you know, 20, 25, 26 at the time. You know, now 38, 39, and ROH now, everybody looks at me as, like, the older guy. I, I, I was talking about this with a friend of mine that, you know, I'm like Kevin Steen's Jack Victory. You know, I'm the, the old vet that comes in, gets a laugh from from the guys, you know. Jack was about 30-something. Yeah. Man. And uh, yeah, so like I've I've become the, the the mentor, you know, where victory was for me. Yeah. So it, it's just a different atmosphere where yeah. we. I don't know what guys do on the road now. Me, I go back to my room, like live the old man life. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's humping, who's smoking drugs. I, I don't know. So like you know, ECW, you had your like little clicks. You'd be like, oh, there's the 420 room, and there's the date rapers, and then <laughs> and then the, here's us getting. Pizza, cream donuts, and pizza. Yeah, yeah. And listening to Jack Victory, have a blast. Yeah, one of the most bored click, except for a couple of times. Yeah, and Dreamer, Dreamer would join us every once in a while. Yeah, that roll with the those. Yeah, Krispy Kreme or pizza, that's what it was. We were all about that. Yeah, man, it was a blast though. Like the fun that we had probably wasn't like ten percent of what some other people had, but it was it was a lot of fun. All right, can you speak about CCW and Dusty? Wow. That's Dusty and Dusty Rose? Yeah. yeah. Dusty, uh, TCW was turned up championship wrestling, Dusty Rose running promotion in uh, Georgia, mostly southern Georgia. And it was a lot of old school guys. And if you check that fucking phone one more time. Right. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> it was Manny Fernandez and his son Dustin and... Barry Wyndham, myself, Steve, Lodi, um, that was working a bunch of some other smaller Scotty Indian. Riggs. Yeah, Scotty Eric, Riggs. Eric, Eric Watts. Eric Watts. And it was old, end up, basically NWA wrestling all over again. And we didn't make no money working for him. No, we were always paid off the house. And the house usually was good, but we didn't see it. There was a many a night. No money? Uh, no. It What's was no money? Like... Not even breaking even, get yeah. your check and rush to the bank and hope it ain't no there's money's in there. Oh my god! But it just yeah. it was the it was the fun of being there with it. What year was this? Uh, Two thousand one. Yeah, it was the fun of being after there. ECW right after ECW. Right after, right after we lost our ass in ECW, and then we go and put with this. Me with Dusty. And Dusty was running a lot of shows too. We were down there a lot. But we had to, we, we got to work Barry for the first time. We got to work oh, with Glacier and uh, uh, I man. I fucked up in front of Barry. Yeah. Dude, this dude is like uh, Barry was working over there. Barry Wyndham, he meets yeah. his wife the first time. What he huh? What was he over there? Barry uh, Wyndham. He was his regular Barry Wyndham. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Barry Wyndham. 
Oh, he was. Um, he was the champ. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. And he was like Dusty's right hand so guy. He he was an all. That's what I was asking if he was off or something. Oh yeah, he was a little bit yeah, off, yeah. but yeah, he was he was the big, big baby face. Yeah. And, and I meet him, and I'm a huge Barry yeah, Windham fan. Yeah, me too, man. man. I watched him as a kid. And, it's sickening to be around here. Oh, and I'm like, yeah, like, and here it was, you know, I had the cowboy boots and the look. It was like, you know, this was something people were looking forward to this. Yeah. And I'm sitting in the locker room, and it's like Dusty and CW and Eric Watts and, and Barry, and I am just in awe of Barry Windham. I'm like, and I go, uh, uh, Barry, do, do you, do you, uh, do you remember the time that you turned on Lex Luger and you, you joined the Horsemen? And he's like, yeah. I go, oh man, that was really fucking cool. Like I totally, like, I didn't have a, a question. And I, I, it was like the Chris Farley show. He goes, this was his, I, I, I knew you were gonna do it. You know why? Because it's the way you walk down. I know you, you looked you look mad that night. I told Eric Watts goes, I told my just, just fucking Chris Farley <laughs> him? I told my friends that night, I go, Barry Windham will say he's in a bad mood. <laughs> and he turned heel out so I was the coolest kid on the block. Barry just looks because that's one thing you never do is oh. as our group or is look into a veteran like that and tell him, remind him of something that you were this age when he did that. You just don't yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, young wrestlers that are watching this video, don't do it to me. Don't do it yet. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh my god. It was so bad. I couldn't get my shirt far enough away from him for that. I never used those words, but I had to, man. But that's, yeah. you know, the, the good thing that come out of working with Dusty and TCW is where the Extreme Horsemen were formed. It was myself and Steve and Barry Windham. It was Dusty's. You know, Steve had the idea for four, but it was me and Simon Diamond, but never with the Extreme Horsemen. And we were so close at one time to being all together, me, Simon, and, and CW and ECW. And, it, like, it was ready. and. Jack Victory is going to be our manager, and then maybe Don Marie was going to be in involved somehow. Hopefully not. And uh, it, it like a week before, Paul's like, "Oh yeah, by the way, you're going to turn babyface." I'm like, "Well, what about CW? Oh, we're going to put Johnny Swinger in with that." And then you yeah. guys had some success. Yeah, you know? we had we had a good a good thing running, and then with you know, um, we got to win the TCW, and you know, Barry Wyndham was there, and he put us together one time, and he goes, "Look." You know, Barry was one of the original Four Horsemen, and you two guys came from the Extreme, so we're just going to call you guys the Extreme Horsemen. And that, that night, Steve and I are working Dusty and Dustin, and we're beating them. We tied, we actually handcuffed Dustin to the ring, or to the uh, turnbuckle, and we're beating Dusty down. And mind you, this Whoa. is in Southern Georgia. People oh, are right. hitting right. the ring. Yeah, it was riot. It was going to be a riot. Oh. The young boys hit first. We take them out. Fans hit the ring. We're literally fighting them. Because we couldn't tell who anymore, who was the wrestler and who was the fan. So many people were coming in. We, we didn't know if it was like the young boys. That. Oh. I think I used to have a video of it one time. Damn like, Masters. Uh, um, about that time, Barry Windham hits the ring, and he stays us off, and we're standing back, standing back. And he turns around, and he has a chair in his hands. And he clocks Dustin oh, with the chair. Oh, screams him with this chair. And then starts beating Dusty down. And we all stand there, and that's the night. And so we're, we're as he's walking, as Dustin's, as uh, Barry's walking out, some guy that was like with part of the ring crew walks by and says something smart to Barry, and Barry headbutts him in the nose. Fucking breaks his oh, nose. Oh, it's disgusting. And Barry walks in between and goes, I guess he'll never do that again. Yeah. <laughs> and starts laughing. We're like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Yeah, and then that night we formed the Extreme Horseman, and man, we just went with it. the burst. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I never knew nothing about that, but yeah. the matches would have been good, bro. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there were some fun shows. Yeah. <clears throat> if you could have added maybe one or two more people, you know? But we did later on when it was. Yeah, 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 we did game. once the MOW yeah. stuff came along, we did. Which we'll get to in the next part. All right, we're gonna wrap up part four. We'll be back with part five in a few. All right, we're back. Nokfaben.com, part five. CW, Steve Carino. Welcome back. All right. Um, can you speak about Ribbon Lodi and the signs? <laughs> that was actually the, the mastermind of this man right here. Everybody knows. Of it. I get bored in the locker room, you know, there, there's only so much you can do, you know, 
you know, ha having your balls hanging out of the locker room, you know, for so many hours. So <laughs> yeah. Lodi always had these signs, and I thought, wow, he makes them, and then he leaves them there. It's always whatever. He doesn't look. Whatever town you're in, he loves them. Lodi loves, uh, you know, Atlanta. Lodi, you know, makes some noise. I hear Lodi, <laughs> just, just all kinds of things putting him over his because he's a good-looking guy. He's a baby fade. He has a great body. And so... <laughs> this guy, but I, I would draw a whole bunch of different signs for him, and I would slip it in. Yeah, so because he he'd, be, he'd have a thing, he'd be like, look, and he wouldn't look, and he'd just tear one off, and he'd have another. <laughs> oh, I can't. What was some of the bad things I? It had? was well, like you know, Lodi, Lodi hates <laughs> this <laughs> town, hates you. Uh, <laughs> you people suck. You people are bad. I'm, a, I'm gay. I'm yeah, gay. It's <laughs> different. Lodi loves that was the first night me. he threw it. He's like, oh. Lodi rocks Carrollton. He yeah. And then he looks and he pops it up. Yeah, he, and everybody was like, what? And he turns. <laughs> he, comes, he comes out. He never looks at his signs. They're folded up. His music hits, which is Welcome to the Jungle, Guns N' Roses. He does it. He runs out. He takes his first sign. He pops it up, waiting uh. for the big pop. And the fans are looking at him. Oh. What? what the hell? And he has his puzzled look <laughs> on his face. And... He takes the next one and he knows this. He's a, he's a great guy. I have sabotaged them he's all. Boom! He throws it up and there got a couple boos and he's the big baby face and he turns around and looks and he looks and he sees him. He sees him. And he folds him up. He throws him up. He immediately turns and looks at the entranceway and here we are, especially this one, standing there looking. Oh! And we are dying laughing. So it was a rush to try and get his poster board every night. He was smart to it, but that was that was funny. It, it couldn't have, you couldn't have planned it. Oh. I mean, him running out and not even paying attention to his signs and seeing that he's expecting his reaction. He don't get it. You know. I could imagine. MLW, can you speak about MLW? MLW was a lot of fun. Man, I loved it. Major League Wrestling is they called it hybrid wrestling. And, was Corbyle, Corbyle's brainchild, and he took old school, nude school, high flying Japanese. He flew Japanese guys over and put it down in Florida, and it was a, it was literally hybrid. It was a mixture of everything, and it got over. It was yeah. good, man. Had his own Florida? TV show. Yeah, he had the the one of the guys that was the ECW cameraman filming it. He had Joey Styles doing the voiceovers and, yeah. and things, and um, he. Had you know like Raven and Sandman and us and Kojima and um, Mike Awesome, Mike awesome Sanjay, Dutt. Sanjay Duck, Christopher Daniels, Perry Lynn, Eric, all See, kinds of punk? talent. Yeah, Punk when Punk was getting his start, um, everybody. Yeah. Um, and, and it worked. And then he had he was gonna push the horse. He was gonna make the horsemen his top guys. His top yeah. guys. Remember, he had the. He said, "I vision you and CW with Simon Diamond." We're like, "Holy shit! We've been wanting to do this for years." Yeah, he was, it was the one. He was he was the one that made it happen. And we jumped uh, Dusty and Terry Funk one night in Fort Lauderdale, beat them down, and we formed the Extreme Horsemen that night. And it was his idea to make us his top heels, which Raven never thought it would oh, get over. He never he, did. He couldn't stand the fact that we were the top heels because he thought our gimmick and the way we work would never draw money. But the thing was, wow. the horsemen against the Funkin' Army and the horsemen as the heels, every town we run in in Florida was the same towns that ECW ran in back then in the 90s. And then before that Florida Championship Wrestling. Yeah. So you had our two mixes. And we, as the top heels, Outdrew whatever ECW. Yeah. Oh my ever. God! Can you do me a favor? Give me a close up of that arm right there, for everybody that says it's wrestling is fake. Lift that shirt up a little bit, no, no, no. please. Get a close up on that, Joe. I just noticed that. Yeah. What's that from? Uh, barbed wire. Wow. Scissors from Sabu. Yeah. That was <laughs> fun. I love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, we got two extreme wrestlers. Up it was today. It, it was fun sticking it and showing that we could draw and we could be on top. Cause when he was on top at ECW, we outdrew him in Florida. Yeah, cause of course that was 
the main place he ran was, was Florida. Uh, we had some fun moments, though. Yeah, we did. We remember did. beating up Sam, man? Yeah, there was one night in, in, I can't remember the name of the bar in Orlando that... T taboo? Yeah, it was a taboo that we were supposed to, we were running a program with Hack. It was basically getting ready for the uh, war games, and uh, we were supposed to do something with Hack. We were supposed to do a vignette for TV. Yeah. And he was late. He was late. The show was getting ready to start, and somebody says, all right, Sandman's here, Sandman's here. Steve comes up with the idea of when he comes up, we're going to beat the piss out of him for real. Get He's going to jump him. Just going to jump him, get the camera ready. He has no idea it's coming. Not one. He comes up the comes up the steps, and we go to his ass. Yeah, I mean, he, he's you know he's a loud character even in the back, and he comes up, he's like, yeah, and that quick we were on him. He had no idea what was going on because <laughs> you know the TV cameras on. We're in this small like little room. We have to be real stiff with him too. Yeah. He finally catches on to it and starts selling, boy. But yeah, but yeah, he tried fighting back at first. <laughs> yeah, he started. He thought it was a shoot fight. We were worried. It was me and Simon and uh, Steve, and we were wearing his ass out. We were oh, we were beating him down. Just, and after after you hear cut, he's like, "Oh, I get it. Yeah, you guys are doing a promo. It was great. This it's like the first time Simon and I worked. Doctor Death Steve Williams. This guy tells us how stiff he is from being in Japan. It's like, Doctor Death, you know, you need to go in there and bring it to him because he's stiff in the ring. If you don't, he's gonna wear you out. Just like it is in Japan. We go in the ring with, with Dr. Death, as soon as we lock up with him, me and Simon start beating him down. I mean, everything. We're clubbing him like a seal. And, and, he's, uh, and every time he's hitting us, it's like getting hit with a, a pillow. It's, he's basically just tapping us, just tapping us. Wow. And, I mean, we still go to him the whole match. He comes in the back, he goes, what the fuck was that about? <laughs> like, you guys beat my ass. <laughs> So say like he had ribbed us and told us that Dr. Dev was so stiff and we yeah. had gotten worked up. Hey, yo, uh, you you were taking it to him before yeah, we you back, took it to yeah. You're lucky he didn't beast on you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> who did we beat the fuck out of? Or who did you beat the fuck out of on that show in Georgia that Glacier told you to? It was that young kid. And then Marty didn't want to work with us after. Oh, yeah. We did a uh, Steve and I one night. We come to a show and this kid comes in. And he's put, all of a sudden he's putting himself over for no reason. Steve like and I big are, attitude. Yeah, Steve and I are stretching. Mind you, he's got this Korean girlfriend that's hotter than fish grease. I mean, she's smoking. And she's got these little shorts on and she's showing everything. And I'm oh, like, and instantly I'm attracted to her because I'm already, I'm, I've been dating an Asian. He's got yellow fever. Yeah, I got had yellow fever at the time and it's the good kind. So he's on it about it. And me and Steve are getting more hot about him. The attitude this kid has. So we go in the back and Glacier pulls her to the side and says, hey, you know this kid right here? Oh, yeah. Um, he says, I'm not beating him up tonight. And that is so uncharacteristic of Glacier. Glacier's like one of the nicest guys, like most gentle guys you'll ever meet in wrestling. Yeah, for him to like call out a hit was like, what? Yeah, we were, yeah, so we went in and basically beat the brakes off him. And I was trying my damnedest to steal his girlfriend. Oh, and I would tell the kid, I'm like, protect your face, here comes a kick. And, and you weren't. You were just no, beating him. No, we didn't. Yeah, we were just, like I said, we were And his like, partner would come in the ring and we were bumping around. Yeah, like, we were, yeah, it was yeah, nothing. We were bumping like, like he was Superman. When he come in, he had no part of that. And the same promotion we worked for, a few months later, we got to work with Marty Gennetti. And Marty Gennetti comes in knowing he's working the horseman. And don't want to work or something. Yeah, he's like, guys, I saw what you did to those kids. <laughs> we're like, no, Marty, no. He's like, I don't know. Yeah. And he didn't want to work with us because he saw, he saw what we did. So he didn't work with you? No, no he, he ended up doing it, yeah. Yeah, yeah had a good match, too. So yeah. what he said afterwards. He's like, don't kick the shit out of me. Yeah. What he said afterwards after y'all took care of. Oh, oh, he was cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Great. Oh, he's like, man, it's great. You guys are a dream working with us. And it's just like when we worked for this promotion, UPW. Uh, is it Dave or Roy? Are you thinking UWF? UWF, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Dave Hebner. We worked for UWF and Dave Hebner from you know WWE Reverend. He literally told us in front of everybody when he told me and Steve. Could be Earl. Yeah, it was one of the Hebners. He said that we were the his favorite tag team of all time to be in the ring with. Not just here, but of all time. Yeah, we used to have a lot of fun with Hebner in the ring. Yeah, he was really big on us. He said, you guys are my favorite tag team to work with ever. 
I met his brother. Yeah, which which was a great Oh, he was at the event? Oh, I met you. Yeah, 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 the October 15th one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I met which him there. I got a picture of him. The skinny where, one is uh, The Earl? skinny one is the one that works in TNA. Right, 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 him. Yeah, I met his brother. Yeah, that's the one. Office, that, yeah. His office. Yeah. Uh, I was, yeah, Hebner was such a fun guy. Yeah, he was a good, he was a good yeah. man ring with, yeah. Right. Even you we were like the designated like mid car guys. Always. Yeah. We'd go in there with AJ Styles and Chris Daniels one night, the Dudleys the next night, and the two local guys the next night. So how long was that run there? Uh, MLW was a couple years. Two years, I think. Yeah, and that in U U P U U W F was about two as well. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't last. Like two long. seasons. Yeah, that was the race car driver. Um, so the two years you spent at MLW. How was the bookings there? Like, um, what every day, once a week? No, once a month. Once sometimes once twice. Oh, once a month. Yeah, okay. yeah sometimes twice. Okay. When they had TV too, so we had you know promos and vignettes to film and things like that. So in between that, you was doing it just we were in Japan. Shows. No, we were okay. in Japan. Yeah, mostly Japan. We were over there like twenty six weeks a year. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Can you speak about Carino, Funk, the Bob Wire, and the pissed off chair shot, please? Well, that was MLW. Yeah, that was that was MLW. It was, it was Steve, his first ball war match with Terry Funk in Fort Lauderdale, and beforehand, um, it was a, another big build up right before War Games. Then beforehand, Terry got us together, Simon, myself, and Steve, and says, "You hey guys, whatever you do, please don't hit me in the head with a chair shot because he had been having some problems in the head." I'm like you know, we love Terry to death, I'm scared of him, but we love him to death, and we're really respectful of him. Yeah. Yeah, we are. We're really, you know, the, the upcoming story won't reflect that, but we're really up for respect yeah. Terry. So, him and Terry have a great barbed wire match. Now, I'm supposed to run out, cut Steve out of the barbed wire. Terry's supposed to roll out, punch me. I go down, they go into the finish of the match. Now, I cut Steve out of the barbed wire. There's a long strand of barbed wire left. Terry rolls out, punches me. As I sail, he grabs me. I went, holy shit, here we go. And he hates barbed wire. He drags me, and there's a there's actually he wraps me in a barbed wire, and there's actually a picture that was in a Japanese newspaper of him wrapping me up in the barbed oh, wire. And it's not here; it's all here. Oh. And I, I have it like this because it's cut you into me because I'm freaking the fuck out. Me. And I'm and he's like, put your hands down. I'm like, kiss my ass. Oh, like that guy's this. crazy. It's all around me, he puts he's got it in me. Finally, Simon Diamond comes in, makes the save, and I blank. All I know is that I'm pissed off. Oh, he I, was hot. I was so mad. I hadn't been, been a long time since I've been that mad ring. I remember looking at Simon and saying, watch what I do. They go through the finish of the match, and this, this is on video. I actually had this. Yeah? It, it's it's, it's uh, Terry rolls up to his knees as I come in from the chair. I come in with a chair, and instead of hitting Terry in the chair like this, I draw back, and the back of the chair hits my ass. Is how far apart I draw back. <laughs> And swing it just Killed as him. hard as I can across his head. I fold it across his head. Oh, oh that was brutal. He lays oh. down, and I hear Steve go, I'm sorry for CW. I'm sorry. Yeah. He's apologizing. I was so yeah. mad. What he did, I bet you he didn't sell it. No, he did. He went he down. He sold in the no, back. He went down. No, yeah. I mean in the back. He didn't put it over. That's Nothing what I mean. He didn't sell it to yeah. you. He didn't put it over. Yeah, he didn't put it over. At all. I felt bad afterwards. But I heard time, those stories about I him. I didn't care. He will not put it. He's tough. Yeah, because I, I, bl <laughs> I blanked on it because I was, got so mad. It was blast. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You crazy. How come I like a dick on that, didn't I? How was it to finally totally. getting to work with Simon? Oh, it was so cool. It's Simon Diamond's an awesome, awesome dude, man. He, uh, Didn't real, he real intelligent. WWE? No, he's oh. an agent for TNA. Okay. Real smart, like, real good on promos. I think, like, the world didn't get to see the best of yeah. Simon Diamond. Yeah. And him and CW had such great chemistry as a team. Um, and, you know, all three of us together, because... You had three different promos, three different styles. You know, we really just meshed so well, and it, it was cool because you know we had grown up in the, in the wrestling business together. So it's here was our chance to finally be together in, in a money drawing situation. And it, it worked. Our promos flowed. 
um, the, our matches, whether it was me and you know Simon, because me and Simon were the tag champs, he was the heavyweight champ, and we held the belts the entire time, and it got over. And the fans hated us, but loved us. You know, they would boo us, but we'd always have great matches. You know, I was working with Dr. Death and D'Lo, Dr. Death and whoever, and Steve was with Terry, Dusty. Uh, also, it didn't matter. We'd always have these things, you know, always gel and always work and build up to the war game stuff. Yeah, um, I was nice about war games. That sounds like an old WCW. It was. Games. It was our first one, and it was the Horsemen. Where was that at? It, it was in Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. We came out and had a mascot with us because there was only three of us, and the mascot made number four. Steve does the promo, and we announce the mascot. He pulls it off, and it's just incredible. Oh. Um, Steve does another promo and announces, and Barry Windham comes out of the back. Because oh, yeah. I think people thought Barry Windham was going to be under the mask. Yeah. And then when I announced Just Incredible, they were like, oh, okay, it's cool, Just Incredible. And now they're thinking there's no more surprise. And then we're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we have a second surprise. And there it was Barry Windham. Yeah, okay. and it was our five against Terry Funk, uh, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, um, Sam Man, Sabu, and at the end, uh, Bill Alfonso. Bill Alfonso. And me and Sam Man started in, in the war games. Um, and it was fun. It was a little different war games because we brought weapons in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they had two, 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 just like the old yeah. war games, except there was no, nothing on top. And by that, along that time, Steve and Sandman had heat over something, over you know breaking guy code. And Steve comes in and grabs the cane. And I remember holding Sandman across the road while Steve was wearing his ass out with that cane, screaming at him that you broke guy code. And same man is apologizing to him while he's doing it. Like the first yeah, few we waxes. Yeah, made up in the ring. Yeah, made up in the ring. First few waxes he's hitting is hitting my hands. And I'm like, holy oh. shit, I'm trying to hold. Steve didn't care. He was like, damn, blank and swinging. That thing, you broke Kygo, you son of a bitch. And he's like, pow, pow. And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, yeah. But the war game, the finish the war game, man. This guy takes fire in the face from Terry. Wow, Ford. I took it. First, I took, I took a branding iron to the back. That hurt. And then uh, as hot. I got up, he yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, he lit it on fire and right to the back. Kidding. And then uh, the, you know, it was only on for a second. Like I had the mark on me for like a month. Oh my god! And then when god. I turned around, he blew the fire in my face and just singed me. The burn mark didn't stay. No, no, no but like it burned my beard and everything. Wow. Oh. Can you speak about um, working bright Christmas got too hot? I was in UWF. Yeah, it was for uh, Herbie Sadler's UWF. We did it in South Carolina one night, and we never worked with neither one of them, but we're trying to push the match together. Brian Christopher, Brian Christopher is basically being Brian Christopher. He's acting like an idiot. Yeah. Um, he's calling spots that make no damn sense. Duck double doubles over to what the hell? Yeah, even Scott the Steiner. Steiner yes, they making was, fun of him. They were making fun of him. What the hell's a double double? You know, he's doing that. But what it was, we get in the ring and we get in the ring with Scotty. Scotty works like a champ. I love Scotty too hot to death, man. He yeah. works like he works great with us. Oh yeah. Brian Christopher gets in there, and he goes to he's 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 begging because he's heard about how Steve and I can work in the ring and how stiff we can be if you fuck, if you fuck with us. Yeah. And he's like, man, you know, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. That's all he kept saying. Yeah. No problem. We'll take care of you. It's Brian Christopher. You know, we got you know mad respect for you know because your dad whatever. Anyway. He's doing things, he's like hitting us hard. Hitting us. And careless and, too, like ear, like under the eye. Yeah, like, it's like dude, you know, we we keep telling him to ease up, lighten up, watch this, that, other. Finally, the the finish of or the what finished it off was he goes to clothesline me over the top rope and like knocks me loopy as he's doing it. Cause I protect myself, hold the rope when I go over the top rope. He traps my arm and clotheslines the piss out of me in the face. So when I flip over, I really don't know where I'm at and I can't land right. Steve comes out there and I've landed on my wrist to protect myself and I thought it was broke. I, I lost it. You know, with that, it still don't take off my temper and I tell Steve, watch this. <laughs> so I get in the ring and I said, I said, let's beat the fuck out of him. Steve goes, okay. So me and we go to a spot where he's gonna take my left punch. You know, for people that know me, I got the best punch in wrestling. Oh, absolutely! It, you know, by far, it looks the realest and it is the best. But this night, it was all about hitting him. And when I hit him, I hit him just as fucking hard as I could hit him, and he went down like that. The like crumble. Knocked him up. No, he knocked. Oh. He was round. Then me and Steve go into our tag spots. 
or like double shoulder tackle things like that. <laughs> just to Waste steal them. Just to steal <laughs> that thing as we can be. Stayed on him. And yeah. then when Scotty comes in, it's back to kick gloves again. When he gets yeah. back in, it's the same way. They but get along? Him and Scott. Yeah. No, I didn't think, I didn't think so. Oh, yeah, I didn't no. think so. Uh -uh. Oh, it's oh. one of those things, it's like I, tell, I was telling you earlier, tag partners, you stay together long enough, yeah, you end yeah. up hating them. Yeah. yeah, they're like a wife. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they say you married, so. Nicknamed the general working the max. I think that's where I coined the phrase. Because, you well, know, can for you years. Elaborate what this is? Well, you know, for years, uh, CW puts together almost all the matches. You know, he comes up with some of the ideas. Um, most of the ideas for, like, the, the structure of the match. And this was, like, the case where, like, he really did it all because we were coming right from Japan and we had to go to Charlotte for UWF. We flew right in. We normally would fly. He goes to Philly. I go to Raleigh. Yeah. We flew into Charlotte coming from Japan to go to his show the work, TJ and Kirby Mack, who are two great, they're brothers, two great talents, you know, young talents. They're like, you know, they, they hang around with us and they're, you know, the hardy style, you know. And they did some great stuff, but they would always put it out of order. And yeah. like, then they had the reputation for not listening a little bit. Yeah. And uh, we got there, we got there late for our plane was delayed. And we were literally getting there, getting dressed. We had just wrestled in Tokyo the night before. And uh, CW says to me, he goes, listen guys, you sit and listen to what we're going to tell you. This is going to be a great match. And they did. They listened to it. And, like, we went out there, and it was amazing. You know, people were into it. Like, they looked so good. We, we knew how to make them look good without hurting them or them hurting us. Yeah. And afterwards, it was like they were so happy with it, and everybody was happy with it. I said, wow, this guy's the general. I mean, he's the one that, like, leads the, leads the pack in that. So, yeah, that's where myself... Uh, a lot of people call him General. Tanaka calls you General, yeah. 18 Legrand, you know. Like the whole week before we knew we were wrestling, I sat in my room and come up with this match. Yeah. Even though the night before, uh, when we wrestled Tani and Tanaka, which was another great match, I was still more concerned with working TJ and Kirby because I wanted that, that to be a great match. And no matter what they said, I shot it down. I was yeah. Like, oh, this is how it's got to be. And even with stuff he would come up with, I would take it and twist it and do something else with this. Just kind of, I kind of take charge in the ring and make it work right. He dropped through like high spots from ten to seven, but he made those seven mean something. Yeah. So which made it look like fourteen. You know, really, really put them. Steve's over great. Break. He's great with coming up with ideas for stuff, and that's his niche with the promoting and thing. He's great with coming up with different ideas, and then he turns it to me. To put it into the match, yeah, where it's gonna make the best. Fill in the blanks. Yeah, all these guys that you were saying was general. That that say he's a general. They were older guys. Yeah, yeah, all around our age. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, how does it, I know that's your friend and everything, but he has been in the business longer than you. No, he's been right? in a year longer than me. Oh yeah? Year long. yeah, yeah. All right, so how does it feel, you know, to be called this by these high rank yeah. guys? How does that make you feel as a wrestler? I, it's fine uh, because. I know if, you know, my, my work, the way I look at it, my work rate speaks for itself the same with him. You know, they call him a king because when he goes out there, he takes charge. You know, he, he, on the mic, wherever it is, you can't top him on the mic. He'll out talk to you any day of the week. Um, with me and wrestling, you give me the chance. I'm going to prove to you I can work. I can take, you know, that coat and make it look like a five-star match. Or I can take somebody that's just in the business and make it look like a five-star match. And that's the way I go about it. And these guys call me, yeah, it's a, it's a great compliment. But I... I take the business seriously with that. I'm not going to go out there and half-ass anything. I'm going to go out there and give you everything I got, whether it's five people or the 50,000 that we've done in front of the Tokyo Dome. So that, that's how I go about it. Mm -hmm. It's funny you put it that way, you know. Um, shows how much of a professional you are. And what's, sense, the, you know? really, what's the point of being in this business if you're just going to waltz through it? Yeah. You know, we take pride in what we do. I mean, you saw his arm, you see his forehead yeah. and how he's beat up. And I know how his body is because I've been his friend for so long that I know how it is for him to get out of bed and one of the things he's got to do and how bad he's, you know, I've been in matches with him where he don't know who he is. I have to take him to the back. You know, it's the pain and the suffering we do for this. You know, he's been in matches. Blank out right yeah, after the he's match. Got, he's gotten knocked yeah. out. He's gotten hurt so bad that he's been cut up so bad. He's bled so much. And this. 
it's, it's what we do for do this Do me business. a favor, get a close up on his forehead real quick. So again, that's when people are the ignorant ones that call our business fake. I mean, you, you look at this guy, you don't, you don't see the pain and suffering. You don't see how bad my back is. You don't see how bad his knees, his back, his shoulders are. But we know because yeah. we're, we're there. I know too. Yeah. If you know the business, you know. If you understand it, right. see it for what it is, you know. Can you speak about um, working the, the Indies together and beating up the guy, the, the guy in the GA and stealing his GF? Yeah. Oh, that was the guy we talked about. Yeah, yeah. we talked. We talked about him. Uh, yeah. That's where Marty didn't want to work with us. Yeah. Yeah. Marty's right now. All right, this is gonna get hard. This hard as it gets. Ah, it's as hard as it get, gets, girl. <laughs> oh dear God. Oh, this was this was disgusting. It was a disaster. It was one of it was one of these the, the women we brought back one night. He brought back. Yeah, hey, I brought the other back. Bed. Yeah, he was another bit. Um, we we go to a show. And I've known her for a long time, and it was just something to do. And we get we get drunk at the bar. I come back, and my back I was been, sleeping. My yeah, whatever. My back had been bothering me, so I had like a couple pain pills in me, and I was sitting there. And every guy <coughs> had that problem every now and then. While I was drunk, uh, pain pills. It won't get up, and she was wanting to do something. So we're laying there, and she well, again, she didn't want to do anything because she says that he's awake. He's like. I'm like, no, nah, he ain't awake. He's asleep. Listen, you hear, you hear him snore. Well, she's she was laying there. We're playing around, and I finally, after beating it on her mouth for about five minutes, I look at her and say, "Look, bitch, this is the hardest it's gonna get." We yeah, gonna all I could hear was clunk, 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 clunk. And I'm like, that was her thing. She's I did the thing like I was like looking with one eye. I'm like, what? What the hell is? Why is that noise? And she's like, she said something. And he goes, "Hey, look, this is hard as it gets." Are we going to do this I like, yeah, we're going to do this for now. So I, like, I literally I like, have to put like, my face in the pillow. I swear to God, laughing. I'm reading this question, and I'm thinking, okay, this is as hard as it's going to get. <laughs> it sounds like a match that's difficult. <laughs> no, it's we not. We can do it. Like, yeah. Yeah, we can was, do this. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much it was a match, getting working out. I like, I look back, and it was like, it was just something. I said oh it just God. to pop him. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, when you do stuff like that, you yeah. just pop the boys next to right, you. Head, like, head in the pillow laughing. Yeah, that's all it's about. Be careful. All right, we're going to go into a break, come back with part She's the same one that Randy shit on? No, it's a totally different one. Oh, yeah, she's like freaking, freaking dying. Is she? Yeah, like He feels months. bad now. He don't. Okay, they got to go to break. You talking about Macho Man? No. Oh. No, no, no. All right, yeah, we're going to go into a break. We'll be back with CW and Carino. All right, we're back with part six, OKFaven.com with CW, Steve Carino. We've had a lot of shit going on in life. A lot of shit, yeah. Holy crap. All right, this is an interesting question here to me because I see the way y'all vibe with each other and how cool y'all are. Yeah. And now I'm going to ask you because I can't even imagine how is it to fight each other? <laughs> you don't like wrestling, man. No, I like teaming with him. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Why? Why? Chops right. pretty hard. I, I, you know, I was thinking about asking to take a chop early, but I'm kind of scared. Oh, <laughs> I'm not yeah. even gonna lie. I feel kind of scared. <laughs> yeah, that's why he made me his partner. One, I chop too hard, and I take liberties on. I beat him up. Yeah, mm -hmm. he beat me up at Eric Rules. Yeah. Why well, you don't beat him up back? One thing. Why well, you don't beat him back? Beat up a guy. So why you don't um, him back? Because I was wrong. Uh, you was wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then there was one that we did. We worked each other in Tokyo one time at Hustle, and I don't know why. It's just when sometimes when you do a spot, you're supposed to call it. Hey, watch this! Like you shoot somebody, watch the clothesline. That means hey, a clothesline is yeah, coming. Yeah. He's laying on his back, and I kick the shit out of him in the back. And as he's selling, I go, Oh yeah, watch the kick. Yeah, it's like, he's yeah. like a fucking dick. <laughs> yeah, a total dick move. Wow. Yeah, How many times your foot? Uh, a lot. Australia, which I give you that DVD. Australia is yeah. it's hot. Oh, that was it. great. Oh, yeah. That was a great that. match. Like 25 yeah. minutes of everything. Extreme, yeah. old school, Japanese. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Australia. Beautiful. He's like twice, that. right? Yeah, he said, we fought. 
I, I lost count because we've done these. We fought ECW a few times, house shows. When he was the NWA World Champion, we fought on the Indies. We fought in Japan a couple times. Um, Maybe two dozen at the most. Really, yeah. twenty-four yeah. matches. Yeah, plus or minus, and then you know we had one of our first That's times. A lot of matches, man. Oh, and and to think about it, you know, I mean, knowing the business, we know it's not a lot of matches, but. Yeah, you fight a lot of matches. Over 18 years. It's a lot of matches. Yeah. To me, it's a lot of matches. Yeah, and you find your best friend, and, you know, see, we take a little liberties on it and have fun. But it's like, you know, when we were in Australia, um, we we worked over the match in the hotel room. Yeah. Um, watching Will and Grace. Yeah, watching Will and Grace. You know, we, we rushed back from eating and going to watch Will and Grace. Uh, did these two cool wrestlers watching Will and Grace, but we worked over the match. So at the show, we never went over it. And every, you know, there's 18 matches on the card, literally. 18 uh, matches on this card. Fucking. And if there card. was 18 matches on the card, 20 of them were really bad. Yeah. So we never go over it. Every time we walk by each other, we had a smart ass comment like "fuck you." He's like something like that. You know, Where was this at? In Australia. Australia. Isn't that, so and who you was wrestling for? Uh, some promotion, WCCW. In, in Australia. Yeah, in Australia. Yeah. It was based out of Australia. Yep. Yeah. Wow. We flew to Tokyo, wrestled two nights, turn around, flew home, him to Philly, me to Raleigh. Wait, because didn't we have to take Colby home? Yeah, you did. My son was my yeah. son was on the tour. So. Stayed yeah. eight hours. What's his name? Turn around. Colby. Colby. Yeah. Flew eight hours, or stayed home eight hours, turn around and flew to Australia the next day, 36 hours. We get to Australia, drop our bags, go to SeaWorld. We drop our bags, and we get to SeaWorld. Oh, that's great. We're standing there, and these special kids are swimming with the dolphins. You know, they're a little slow and mental. And me and Steve are standing there like, man, I, I, I want to swim with the dolphins. We've never been with the dolphins. <laughs> and what, I can't remember which one I was saying. Like, what we're going to do is push one of these little retards out of the way, and we're going to oh, swim with the dolphins. Man. Or we're going to adopt one of the little retards. <laughs> You're like, hey, That's my special needs needs to <laughs> so, swim with his daddy. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah, terrible. But, yeah. I would have just been like, oh, I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, but we went to swim with the Dolphins. It was 36 hours flying over the fucking man. country. But, um, but when we fight, we fight each other. It was all, it was really fun. To yeah. Him. And, but then yeah. It, was, it was even better to be a tag I think we didn't have to do it anymore. How many times did you tag me? I don't know. More? Way, Way more, more, yeah. Way more. So must have good chemistry. At least yeah. in the thousands would be easy. Got me wanted to see y'all work yeah. together. I never seen y'all work together. Oh, we got a lot really of good chemistry. Yeah. Together. Yeah, we play off each other well. Alright. I want I want your thoughts on Teddy Hart, if you can, please. Teddy? I love Teddy. I you love so, Teddy. Yeah. I you I, I believe that I am the only person that can book Teddy Hart the right way. When I was booking <laughs> one PW in England, we brought Teddy over. And you have to like stroke his ego because he's like, he's crazy. He's absolutely certifiably crazy. crazy. So you have to like, you know, <laughs> feed his ego a little bit and be like, Teddy, this is what I need. But, you know, you could do that. He did nothing but great business over there for us. Yeah, yeah he would come up with ideas, but we made him. We're like, Teddy, we, this is what we need from you. We need you to be like this veteran and do this and do that. He was nothing but professional. Uh, yeah. I think I'm the only person who knows how to book Teddy. Wow. But he's a strange kid. Can you say speak on him on your thoughts? I don't know him well enough. I just know I've just heard he was a strange duck. Yeah. 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 He's definitely strange. Good enough. Good enough. But man, he's a hell of a talent. Good enough. I'm glad you spoke good about him, honestly, because he gets a lot of heat, you know? Oh, uh, he gets it. He deserves it too, but I don't he's know. a hell of a he's yeah, a hell I'm of a talent. I'm not in the business in that way to know, so you know, he's, that's why I ask. Yeah. You know? He's a hell of a talent. It's just, I think, finding the right person that can book him. Yeah. He seems like a really good talent. He can yeah. work. Oh, yeah. Seems like he can work, man. It's just nuts. Oh, I got one qu one more question about him. Do you know if he's really a heart? Yeah. He's really yeah, he's a heart. definitely a heart. His, his mom is a heart. Well, his dad's an yeah. anus. And, uh, right. yeah, his mom's a heart. I wanted to get that out there because just incredible say he wasn't a a heart on my camera. So no, I no, he's to, definitely I a heart. Get, I don't know, you know. Yeah, his. Uh, I'm trying to think what his mother's name is. Yeah, and her, and her husband, BJ Annis, was a wrestler for a little bit, but he he owned a gym in Calgary that they all used to work out. Yeah. At. All right. Okay. Thank you.
Alright, I want to know your thoughts on the indie circuit. Mm. Both of y'all. Mm. There's too many wrestlers. Too many. It's too easy to get in this business, and there's too many indies out there. That's why it makes it hard for guys like us to make money. Because you can go to Walmart and get a pair of boots and, and knee pads from the sport good sections and call yourself a wrestler. It's true. It, it, you know, it's too many guys being rushed out there before they know what to do. And, um, you know, it's just because little independent promotions, if you're not happy, you start your own company. And yeah. there's nobody to regulate it, so it, it, it makes it difficult to, for bigger promotions to happen. But you got all these small ones taking that little share or burning the buildings or anything like that. Um, the independent scenes, I don't know, it's kind of rough. I mean, yeah, it, it fluctuates with the economy, though, and how they promote it. I've seen shows with guys that you've never heard of before draw 500 people, and then guys with you know huge names draw 40 people. It's all, I think, how they promote it. Also, in these circuits, only you know, run shows on the weekends, right? Pretty much. For most really? Of yeah. So you basically can't make a living off of these indie shows? Um, you can. It, you got to get to a certain level, though, that where uh, you, you can make enough per out. show. Yeah, you can't just, like, get out of wrestling school and have a full-time job wrestling because you're not going to make that. There's such a, a big difference between a, a top guy and an opening card guy when it comes to, like, independent pay. You know, you, you eventually make that where you get on TV a little bit and you do some stuff. You get thrown into that upper echelon of, of indie pay as opposed to the, the start off where you're $20, $30 and stuff like that. Mm. All right. What are your thoughts on the state of the wrestling industry today? In my opinion, it, it's always evolving. You know, um, what I enjoyed in the late 70s and early 80s about wrestling's dead, you know. Uh, you, you look at the big boom in 84 when Hogan came, that era is dead, you know. The attitude era is dead. It, it keeps evolving. So um, I'm excited. WrestleMania is coming up soon. I'm, I'm pretty excited. It's, you know, I understand the, the evolution of wrestling, the sports entertainment, Vince making his own brand and stuff like that. But I don't think it means that pro wrestling is dead. You know, it's just finding the right person to resurrect it the, the way that it should be. It take it's gonna take something to find that next new thing. You know, people too many people are trying to redo ECW to what we were part of. You gotta stop doing it because there's never gonna be another ECW. Or WCW. They keep trying to redo WCW. Yeah, you, you can't redo it. It is. You can, you might as well stop trying to come up with your own thing. And, Bro, it, wrestling's a roller coaster ride. Ricky Morton told me this a long time ago. Be the, try to be there for the highs and ride out the lows. It's just like a roller coaster. Yeah. So you know, it's been in a low for a long time. You just want to be around for the high when it comes back. All right. That question goes right in. Y'all went in right into the next question with some of the things y'all said. So I just want y'all to elaborate a little more, okay? Do you think it's just a downtime and it will pass or do you think it's going to take something fresh new to bring it back do you think it's impossible um i don't think it's impossible i just think we don't know what the spark is going to be you know i don't know if anybody could have ever imagined that stone cold versus and mike tyson would have been the, the spark that you know boomed wrestling for a few years uh yeah, I, that idea eventually will come up. Somebody will come up with it. And once they come up with it, you know, wrestling will boom again. It's, I, in my opinion, it's, it's got to be made cool for the normal person again. It's something that you know that they'll talk about at the water cooler at the office on Monday or Tuesday morning. And, you know, once that happens, then people start talking, then it's okay to watch wrestling. Even though the ratings tell us that people are watching. So, um... It, it's going to take that next big angle that, you know, is it seeing a rock? I don't know, you know. Um, but it, it's, it'll definitely be something. So, do you think the WWE has to be the one to provide it? No. It's got to be somebody different because if, they, if to me if it was, it would have already been done by now, and it looks like they have no intention. It's got to be the the renegade group or.
go back to territories again like it was in the 80s. It, 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 like you said, it's got to be a spark, something different, something to redo. Yeah, something's got to spark. Yeah, because what they're doing now just doesn't seem to be working. Because yeah, if it was, it would be more more of a talk, more of the ratings than what it is now, the and way we, I look at it. And we got time, you know what I mean? It's the, the, the boom happened in 84 and then 98, 99. Uh, you know, we're approaching it now in 2012, so hopefully, you know, in the next year or two, something will happen to push it back up. Can you speak? Can you speak on the current angle? Is it, it is is it used in the Indies? Not as much. As, not as much. Yeah. Not as much today as it used to be. Back when I like first started, they they tried to to keep it talking, but it's it's not. You know, you still. You try to use kayfabe and thing, but with the way technology and the way things are out there nowadays, it's pretty much you can say it's a lost. So I feel like it's a lost cause. Yeah, people don't believe anymore. You know, yeah. they'll believe why you're in the ring for a little bit, depending on how you do it. But yeah, they're not gonna believe right away. Yeah. Well, that's bad to hear. But it's good to hear that you think it all has to come from the WWE. That's really uh, good to hear. Cause it's good to know that. You know, at least there's still some hope somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for real. But it'll definitely never die. That's good. You know, for somewhere else, at least from WWE, because WWE don't seem like they're getting it anytime soon, honestly. And even if they do get it, I think they just you take it away, the person goes away because they get too famous, or just something happens that... I don't like John Cena. You know, I don't think he's the... That next, well, I'm not gonna say I don't like him, but I don't think, you know, what he's doing for the brand is fine, but he's not that Hulk Hogan status to me, that Stone Cold status, Rock status, you know. I mean, Rock when he, at his day because I think he's coming back doing the same thing. He needs to switch it up too. But anyway, um, can you speak? Can you elaborate a little bit about the word kayfabe? Uh, kayfabe is a, it is a term to like protect the business, like a, a made-up term to protect the business. You know, if a good guy and a bad guy are talking in the locker room, and somebody from the outside walks in, and somebody yells kayfabe, they know to move away from each other. Uh, it was also it was a protection of the business, but now you know now that there's really no protection of the business. It's kind of a dead term. Yeah, you don't really hear. It thrown around anymore like it used to be. The only, time, the only time you use it sometimes is, you know, if you're in the ring actually working out spot, spots and more to get let in the room, you know, the fans get let in the arena. Yeah, yeah. you'll hear one big kayfabe, you know, so you know not to talk to your opponent yeah, in front of the fans. Yep. Thank you. Can you give me a, I don't know, maybe, a small list, like two or three corny terms, any meaning? Um, it's pretty much your ad and Z in somewhere in the in the uh, somewhere in the the word. I haven't spoken so long, I can't remember. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Kizze uh, Fizze. Kizze Fizze. Mizark. The Bizel. Yeah, the Bizel belt. Mizark, Mark. Mizel. So that's the way I use it. Yeah, you're just wow. pretty much adding Z's in there. Kind of yeah. like a rap song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much but it. But the mark, the, the, okay. So I never heard that before. Yeah, if, if you, if somebody can, some of them can talk it quick enough that the normal person can't. I thought the word itself, mark, was a carny word. They yeah, just it switched is. it, right? Mark is car a carny word because you're trying to mark it to someone. You know, oh, look at that Mark, he's, you know, if you point at somebody that you know is like a fan of your yeah. work that, you know, they can make money off of, it's like, oh, that's the, the you know, that guy's a Mark, you know, he, he's a fan of my stuff, so uh, it made it easier to figure out what their target audience was, and that's how, that's how the term Marks came. It wasn't like derogatory, like, Yeah, you know, but it was switched it, over. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, 
basically. It evolved with yeah, Martha. Yeah, was, it, was it Nova or his brother that did the Rocky Johnson Carney talk? Oh, I think it was Donnie Bay. Yeah. Nova's okay. brother, Donnie B, who he gave me a much more better understanding because I didn't, he, I didn't bro, know all no, that. Nova, I Nova's brother, Donnie B, um, sit there you know, one people night. People this, though. It's interesting, you know. It's interesting to me. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's what attracts fans, what they don't, you know, what they don't know, what they don't understand, you know. Give them better understanding, you know. The cuts, all that, you know. I love it. <laughs> I love this interview. Mm -hmm. Alright. CW, how did you become an Anderson? The name was given to me by Gene in 1993. There was guys running the Anderson name that saw me. Gene. Like my, yeah, the only real Anderson. <coughs> um, giving me the name because I looked like an Anderson, worked like one. Can you speak why you say he's a real Anderson? Because that's his real last name. Yeah. Bully Anderson, Arn Anderson, they were, uh, you know. They, they were, were like me. Yeah. They're not, their names are not Arn and Ole. Okay. Yeah. Where Gene Anderson was the original, like, real Anderson, like Lars Anderson, Arn Anderson, Ole Anderson. They're all not family members. No. Yeah, we just happen to look alike. All right, do you think it's impossible for Kate Fate to exist today? With all the information that we have, yeah, but to a point, you can still manipulate your audience. I think um, you know, fans are, are smart to that wrestling isn't like 100% legit, but either are movies, you know, either is Christmas, you know, but you all want it to be real. So I think you could, if everybody would play their part, you could, you could get a little believability back into it, but yeah, it wouldn't be like what it was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you, you can't. You know? Mm -hmm. Wow. I believe you can. I'm like him. <laughs> <laughs> I believe there's ways. There, there may be, but with all the social media, people like putting it out there too much. It's, it's you're never gonna completely shut it down. Okay. Um, your best times together. Wow. Japan, Australia. Seemed like everywhere we went. Yeah. Well, as long as we were together, Japan, we had a great Australia. tour. Yeah, yeah. Every, every tour, every country we went to. Germany. Yeah, yeah Germany. Good yeah. times. Yep. Well done. On the road together. In yeah. China. Yeah. We were always excited. Today, you know what I'm saying? Like we're together hanging out. Yeah. Uh, I was very excited. Your most memorable moment. Together? Together, by yourself. You give me all, all. Together all for me you. was the night that we won the Intercontinental Tag Titles in Tokyo. Yep. Um, Just for the honor. Can you show yeah. the picture? Huh? Can you get the picture? You got a picture of it? Yeah. Can you show it on the camera? Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, it, we really felt like we deserved it. You know, we worked hard. We became the number one tag team. Everybody wanted to work with us. And when they gave us the belts, it was like, wow, we really earned these uh, for working our asses off. So that, that was the most proud I was. Well done. Those belts right there. Thanks. No problem. Um, all right, singles. Singles. Yours. Mine. Probably working Dusty. You work with Dusty. Yeah. Against them? Wow. Yep. Against okay. them. My I quit match at the Hammerstein Ballroom. Uh, with who? Dreamer. So Dreamer. Yeah. Uh, Cause I got through with the, I got through with the match and as I'm walking to the back, everybody in the Hammerstein ballroom is standing up chanting C fucking dub. They're chanting my name, giving me a standing ovation for the match. Right. Because one, it was an I quit match. We pulled it off. That's cool. It was so good. Yeah. Alright. Even to this day, I like watching it. Yeah. Why is it taught to the left to work the left side? 
dancing. It's kind of like dancing. You lead with a certain you know step and stuff like that. Yeah. It's easier if everybody leads with the the left, so you don't you don't get people running into each other and stuff like that. It makes it more fluid. Uh, and then if every huh? I'm glad you know. If you start you with know. the left, you know Mexico they start with the right. But as long as everybody's going in the same way, it makes everything flow better. It makes it easier to learn. It's funny because I thought about it going from the right, and it just looks wrong. Yeah, well, if you watch like Mexican wrestling, it, it looks weird. Yeah. Oh, they do it over there. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Can you explain the differences between Greco-Roman, Calambone, and catch and catches catch can wrestler? Um, you can, more of an, it is more of an amateur style. Uh, catch as catch can is just pretty much you know free fighting in the ring. You know wrestling, you know, whether it be on the mat or you're running spots, but you're you're not putting together anything in the back. Catch as catch can is you know, you know you're in there and you're, you're going off each other's like body instincts. You know, if you see a guy coming off the ropes and he's got his arm here, you're gonna assume it's a hip toss. It's pretty much no calling anything. If you work with somebody long enough, you can work that style. Oh, yeah. Greco Roman's more of an amateur. And Colin Bone? Colin and Elbow? Yeah, Colin and Elbow. So, like Collar and Elbow is like an old English term. You know, yeah. Collar and Elbow. You see collar and Elbow is you know, <coughs> pretty much the first wrestling move you see. Okay. Uh, and same in amateur wrestling, you'll see Collar and Elbow a lot. But I think Collar and Elbow was like a promotion in England for a little bit. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate that. You, you know your you know your business, boy. Yeah. <laughs> I like that because I I, I, I I didn't know much. About, I know I've heard of every different style. Mm -hmm. I know about um, Greco Roman that you know that's basically Olympics that I read yeah, about. Olympics you know, style. so they did the ancestors to the Olympics, right? Yeah. So you know, I watch UFC, so I know that. That's the only one I know, but the differences I never, I never even knew there was three different types of styles, you oh, know, yeah. like that. There's many different styles of pro wrestling. You know, you got oh, your, there's more than that. Yeah, you got your, your your old school, your strong style, King's Road, hardcore lucha libre. Okay. Um, you know, yeah, high spot style. Lucha, yeah, yeah, it's got. There's so many different styles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. This is going to be one of my last questions that I'm going to ask. I'm going to use this a lot in my, my, on my website. Oh, if, if this was your last chance to say something to your fans, what would, it, what would you want to tell them? As a tag team with the, with the Extreme Horsemen, we took great pride in everything we did. We never went out and phoned a match in. We always went out and give the fans their money's worth, whether, as I said before, there was five people or 50,000 at the Tokyo Dome. The person that paid that 10, 20, 30 dollar uh, ticket fee, the horsemen always went out and tried to have the best match on the card and bust our ass with and hurt our bodies. So when you went home at night, you're like, man, that damn Steve Carino and C.W. Anderson, man, those guys give me my money's worth. They went out there and put on one hell of a show, whether we were wrestling, talking, because we've done stuff where we've just talked in the ring and run down the fans, and just certain ones, just to get a laugh. Um, we did it because we love the business. He said this in my, our match in Australia, we don't like being called sports entertainers. We're not sports entertainers. We are professional athletes. We are professional wrestlers. We're damn proud to call ourselves professional wrestlers. Yeah, that's our style. We understand the, the sports like entertainment that. style. I like that. But we're still pro wrestlers I at love the end it. of the day. And I think like the fans need to realize, like yeah, like CW said, we bust our ass every night, whether we feel like doing it or whether you know we're sore or anything like that, but. And that music comes on and that bell rings, it's go time. We're always putting it 100%. Yeah, we, we've even said sometimes back, I don't know if I like doing this tonight, or man, let's just take it easy tonight, or something like that. And when we get in that ring, 
We've never taken it yeah, easy. Yeah, it's go, go, go time. And I hope the fans appreciated us because them enjoying us, you know, we're we're beaten and broken down at our ages now, and but it was worth it to us. Yeah. It, it was worth these fans because this is what we do. You know, this is it's a line you see. I mean, yeah, we're professional wrestlers. It's what we do. Yeah. Best job in the world. Can you put it in your words a little bit? Yeah, like uh, with, with especially with fans, you know. That was good. I like that. Every, everything we've ever done is for the fans. I mean, we, we've never been the big money guys. We've never been um, the, the top guys on TNA or WWE and stuff like that. So for us, there's that pride of, you know, not only the, the love of the sport, but, you know, keeping the legacy going, creating our legacy, helping out the, the, the next generation, showing them, like, what we've done, what we could do, and, uh, you know, keeping everything going. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's an appreciation is, you know, we were two fans getting into wrestling too. So we understand like a fan's point of view. It's, to, to sum everything up is being at ECW and being in Japan and things like that, or especially ECW, there's many nights, as fans know, we didn't get paid. We've heard, you know, for the people that love WWE and think WWE is the greatest thing, we've heard from numerous people at WWE, they've heard our stories of not getting paid in wrestling. Uh, in front of fans because and we still weren't getting paid and they're like damn that we'd never wrestle in front of these people yeah without getting money because if they didn't pay us we weren't wrestling we wrestle why we're professional wrestlers WWE they're sports entertainers so you go enjoy your WWE but just remember fans those people you're popping for you're cheering for if they ain't getting their dollar they don't give a damn about you we did and we went out there and wrestled many a night without getting paid, yeah. just so you'd get your money's worth. So, no regrets. Yeah, so enjoy your sports entertainment. But like we've always said, when you step in the ring with an extreme horseman, see if you get entertained. Mm -hmm. I like that. We'll be back with part six, is it? Seven. seven. The last part part. seven? Yeah. This is the final finale. <laughs> Let's go. I guess the part seven part, you just up oh, and let us run with it. What do you think? It's seven deadly sins. And this is the worst. <laughs> I know. I guess it's the one everybody's been waiting for. They call it. They call it the greatest wrestling story in the history of pro wrestling, and it's the one. The reason we're put together tonight is for the fans to to hear about. Finally, you and I sit together and talk about the sex story of me killing the Japanese woman. You killed her. She's dead. <laughs> now you have to understand CW is quite the Lothario. Yeah, uh, I don't know, it might be in his eyes. I don't know, the way he talks to a girl. He's pretty smart. He can, he's got game. I have no game. Um, so it leads to, we, we were at a town in Japan and uh, there were some Americans there, and you you know you can see Americans, like yeah, they stand out. Yeah, they stand out pretty bad. So uh, they ask us to go to dinner. So the myself, C W Spanky, and Sanjay, maybe Loki. Yeah, we all go to um, dinner. Now it's Japanese custom. If you invite somebody out to dinner, you pay. These guys didn't pay. Not only did they not pay, the dinner was so bad. And it was expensive. Oh, it was like $50 each for but bad food. The, the guy ended up being a teacher that was over in Japan teaching these Japanese girls how to speak English. So there was five or six Japanese girls, and one of them took Only to Only one of them was good looking. Yeah, and that's the one that took to me. Um, I had a, some kind of cross on it. She commented on the cross, and I ran with it. So. While they're in there eating, she and I are outside. Going for a walk. Yeah, we went for a walk. So I think we were making out, you know, this, that, and the other. And we get back, and these and guys At this are, point, we were mad. We're yeah. like, CW better, better be like knee deep in this girl. <laughs> we're like, for the, we just paid $50 for a dinner that we hate. And we had to take, not a shuttle, but we had to take a boat over to this oh, place. Oh, yeah, it was going to cost us money to go back. Yeah, so they were already pissed off. It was a bad were, night. They were like, CW, man, did you hit that? Did you get that? And I'm like, 
no, man, it won't even like that. We just kissed and, dude, she, she was a good kisser. Oh, we all went, you're so gay. <laughs> she was, man. Yeah, that lasted her. forever. Like, she was a that good, girl's a good kisser. She was, man. She was an <laughs> excellent kisser. Um, so for like two and three years, I tried to, we always would exchange emails, and I tried to get to come back to the room. And, and she was like eight hours from Tokyo, Yeah, right? she was way south, man. She was down in the swamp. Um, she lived a long ways, and um, well, we, we, we go was, to a house show. We, we, we one we go to a house show, and she comes and meets us there. And we didn't know though. He knew, but he kept it quiet. He knew that she was going to show up at this place. So, yeah. part of the thing we'd get to the town early, and we would walk around the town. Is this the Otani Tanaka? Yes. Okay. So CW. Uh, CW leaves on his own, like me and Spank, you go somewhere and... Because you get there so early, you ain't got nothing to do, so I'm, I like, usually we go to McDonald's, so I'm just, I bounce, I go on my own. Yeah, it's like, where the hell is CW? So, all of a sudden, Sinjiro Otani and Masato Taka run into the foreigner's locker room, and they're out Like little proud. kids. They're like, Cruise I, Cruise I, uh, CW, and girl, maybe... And then he runs into the, the... I tried to beat him back. Yeah, he's like, door. they're fucking liars. Yeah, he's like... What ended up happening, I met her, and we start walking around the town, and we get somewhere, and she's getting ready to go back. And we end up, we start making out and kissing. Oh, and holding and we're like, hands. We're, we're like a mile from the arena, and I hear honk, honk. And I look over, and it's Otani and Tanaka in this tinted car, and the windows are down, and they're looking like little kids laughing. So she goes on, I get in the car, they take me like near the building and drop, they're laughing about it and drop K me off. Kayfaben, yeah. Yeah, they're Kayfaben. Um, and they run in and then they start making fun of me. Uh, and I tried to beat them back and I couldn't do it. Uh, they start bragging on me about kissing this girl. So finally... She's a good kisser. Though. Yeah, she's still a good kisser. She will always be a good kisser. So it finally leads I'm to... More. We come to Tokyo and we have three days off. We are at Corgan Hall, we have three days off. Um, I get her to come back, stay with me, you know, spend the night, stay three days with me at the hotel. And he says, oh, this is the time. I'm going to, I'm going to seal the deal. She yeah, can't finally. Be. After like three years, we've never hooked up. I said, you know, that's a lot of effort, a lot of work. And this girl, one on my birthday, bought me a $400 watch for my birthday and I hadn't even done it yet. Uh, so she comes to the hotel. We, we work the show. She comes to the hotel that night. Um, we, we finally have sex. Finally, and the next morning we wake up and I come to get you for breakfast. That's it. Oh, not okay. Because there's there's the prequel to that. Um, we have sex again. Now we're I'm doing was it's doggy style. So when I finish up, and again it's a shoot interview. There's no punches pulled. So if you don't <laughs> want to listen to this, you might want to fast forward because it's going to get a little into it. Real nasty. We're hitting, I'm hitting doggy style and I finish and when I pull out, this girl starts gushing blood from between her legs and I'm not talking like just drain, I'm talking like poltergeist, exorcist, spitting blood. Um, I can't make this shit up and it starts freaking me out and it starts freaking her out. Now we're on a Japanese bed which is like the size of a twin. There's blood everywhere, it's all, it's going all up the wall from where she's trying to keep her legs closed and get her something going on. It's all over the sheets. She runs in the bathroom and she stays in there for like 15, 20 minutes. And she, I'm knocking on the door trying to get her to say, hey, what's going on, what's going on? She finally tells me in Japanese, she needs to go, me to go down and get her some pads. So, uh, so I run down to the little convenience store. We're in Rapongi at, at the Iverson. I run downstairs and I get the pads and I bring them back up and I run and she takes them. Stays gone another 20, 30 minutes. Finally, she comes out now. Most Japanese women are white. They're already, they're, they're skin. This girl was ghostly white when she comes out. The bleeding stopped, but by then, my bed, the sheets are soaked with blood, the pillowcases, the side, the towels, everything is soaked with blood. Um, before she was using it in the bathroom, everything is soaked. It's like, I don't know how this girl had so much blood that she lost. I couldn't have lost this much blood and still been alive. So, I get all the sheets and I'm bundling them up and I'm getting ready to take them out. About that time when she sits down and we're trying to talk, I hear a knock on the door. Is this? He's late for breakfast. He says, so, you, you want to go eat? Yeah. So he opens up the door and the first thing that was strange was 
He doesn't like open the door wide. He like sneaks out. I'm like, what the fuck <laughs> is this? So he's going and he proceeds to tell me the story over an egg McMuffin. And my first thought was, you were so full of shit. Yeah, he didn't believe like, it. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. this is the girl that cost us $50. And yeah. Look at CW, you know, he's banging so hard that he's making her bleed. So we come back to the room and... Uh, I had given her the key in case she wanted to walk out. Right. I knock on the door. And it was like no a answer. movie, no answer. Now, the Japanese hotel rooms are not like American hotel rooms. They're very, very small. You have enough room for a bathroom that's off by itself, your bag, a small bed, the, a, a desk like sitting behind us, the TV, and that's it. It's not very big. I knock on the door again. We don't hear anything. He looks at me and says, Hey, maybe she's dead. I'm like, dude, he goes white. I said, don't. Uh. I like start shaking. I said, dude, don't fucking say that. I knock on the door. I'm like banging. I'm like, are you in there? I hear some rustling. She gets to the door. She opens it up. She goes, sorry, lost too much blood. And by the time she passes out, like in a movie, I catch her. Oh. Her head's thrown back. Her legs are down. I'm looking at her like, what the fuck? Is I am this? thinking, I gotta get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so I'm like, dude, we gotta put her in the rooms. I walk in the room, I set her down, and this motherfucker. As I go in the room, I turn and look, and instead of him being my best friend and coming in and helping me, he comes in like partial way where the, the wall turns because he's like this, and I can only see half of him. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? He said, I don't want to be a full accomplice to this. I just want to be a partial accomplice. Yeah, I think we just got the tag belts back. And this yeah, so if bad. anybody goes to jail, it's going to be me and not this guy. Oh. She's laying in the bed, and I start slapping her. Yeah. She's not coming to He's me. like, come on and help. I turn the corner, and I'm like, oh, my lord, there is blood everywhere. And I mean, not just on the sheets that he wrapped up, but the bed, the floor, the walls. There's like, yeah. <laughs> somebody who's been, definitely been murdered in here. And he goes, she's like, ah, water, water, I need a towel. And he's like, go get a towel. I go into the bathroom. There is blood, and I let out like the biggest like scream, like you. I was watching a horror movie. I let out the scream. It's probably real girly, but I was like, oh, there was blood everywhere in the sink, on the mirror, on the floor. Like she so, passes out again. By the end, he comes back. There's no towel. What the hell are we going? There's to do? no clean towel. I'm slapping her. She ain't coming too. I can't feel a pulse. I'm shaking her. I'm like, Keith, wake up. Please, for the love of God, oh. wake up. She's not waking up, Steve. What the fuck are we going we're to do? We're thinking about things to do. Options she's we're dead. like, she's dead. Yeah, That's we're thinking thing. she's dead and we're, we've just killed somebody. Yeah, he goes, look, I'm going to call Atani because we know Atani's had to bury, bury a body before. Yeah, we're, we're and that is, I was total serious. I was like, let's call Otani. I think he's probably buried the body. <laughs> I take, I said, no, 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 Sajiro Otani, like Sajiro one of the top guys. Yeah, he's the, he's the big, one of the big bosses there. Okay. I said, no, 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 we're, we're not going to do that. I have a huge suitcase. Yeah. I go over, I unzip my suitcase, I start throwing shit out. He said, what the hell are you doing? I said, dude, we're going to take this bitch, I'm going to stick her in my suitcase, I'm taking her downtown Roppongi, and I'm dumping her out. I'm not being charged with a murder here. Oh, it was so bad. And then You would have did it? So, yeah, 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 did it? yeah. I it? went back to her, I shook her wow. some more, she come back to me. Exclusive, no kayfabe and CW with a dog up. <laughs> I <look at> her. <laughs> At that moment, you never know what you're going to do at that moment. But she, she, she finally, she comes back to, what the hell is going on? She, oh, too much blood. I said, were you a virgin? And she goes, no. So Steve, she passes back out. Steve says, look, when we were in California, I wrestled Jerry Lynn. I lost way too much blood. Orange juice. They kept feeding me orange juice. Me and him bounce down to the little convenience store right under us and get orange juice. We run back up. I come back up. Again, she's passed out. She's not coming to. I'm slapping her, shaking her, trying to get her back up. Finally, I grab the back of her head. She comes to. I take the orange juice, get it, in her, get it in her mouth. She goes back out again. By this time, this one... All right, I'm out of here. Yeah, I'm, I had to go. I had seen enough. I had been a part of enough. So we had three days off with this. I don't see him for three days. He did not want to come around with me being part of this. I'm so scared. I'm laying in the bed with this girl. 
every so many 30 minutes having to shake her and wake her to make sure she's not dead because as soon as she's dead, she's out of here. I'm taking her down the I'm not saying putting up with this anymore. Now the worst part is he no, puts her crazy. on a train back to her hometown. But at this point, you really, we really don't know if she's alive or not. He probably put her on the train thinking, well, she's got eight hours. Yeah, she wakes if up she dies, she dies. Yeah. She finally comes, after, after three days of this, I mean, not leaving and barely eating, she finally comes back to and she's sitting on the edge of the bed. This is the third day now. It's the third morning. And she has to finally wake up and take the bullet train back home to where she's at. And we're trying to talk as well. What the hell's going on? What happened? She has no idea about what's going on. She had no idea what happened. All I know, we had sex and something busted. So I a get her down. I get her. Yeah, that's probably what it was. I get her down to the bullet train, and I basically put my foot in her ass because she wants to sit there and talk and kiss and hug and miss you. I'm like, get your ass on that bullet train because if I get you on a train and the doors close, I'm done with you. I ain't got to worry about it. So when I get back upstairs, I'm sitting with Steve, and I'm like, you know, I'm really not going to have sex no more this week if I find out that she's going to be okay. So like, and He never did. This is where I usually uh, you know, embellish on the story and said that he never heard from her again. <laughs> but actually about six months later, I got an email from her saying that she, in her best English translation, it was like some kind of, Aneurysm, hemorrhage, right? hemorrhage, hemorrhage, or something like that, that she had down there, uh, that, that she went to the doctor, and um, I had really have not seen her since, talked to her, but was, it's all wrapped up in the, the whole point of it, there's, there's a moral to this story, I guess the moral of the story is, never let CW take your doggy style, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with that being said, Guys, thanks so much for sitting around for this three and a half hours. This is the shoot interview with the Extreme Horsemen, and I hope you've enjoyed it because you see what happens when these horsemen take shoot interviews to the extreme. All right, I got one question before we go, though. Would you have been accomplice? I probably would have, right? <laughs> yeah, he wanted, me to be, he wanted me to be in prison over his rape of Britney Spears, but yet when I'm a dying, he ain't going to be there for me. That's wow. the, best, that's the right? best friend for you. Oh, best friend. I was scared. Yeah. That was a, that was a bad night. Oh, that was a, bad. I don't really want to go through that again. I, I wouldn't want to go through it either. All right. Later, guys. Down with CW and Steve Carino. Thank you for your time. I oh, my pleasure. It. Thanks for having us. Thanks for it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah. Very much so. Thank you very much. No kayfaven.com.